So I think we should start with the introduction to this uh, conference, three-day conference. Again, for those of you who uh, came in uh, later, my name is uh, Anja Mia. I'm one of the uh, two co-organizers and hosts uh, for this conference, together with my colleague Britta Weifen, who is based in the UK. We will all both say a few more words about this conference and uh, about ourselves in a few minutes. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to the director of the OECE Academy, Dr. Alexander Wolders, who will also share a few words on behalf of the OECE Academy here in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan with you. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anja. Thank you. Um, yeah, dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, Welcome to our international workshop on China's Belt and Road Initiative and to our question if it's a curse or a blessing for democracy in Eurasia. Um, and I need to continue with the usual disclaimer I have been doing over the last year that is expressing my regret that we have to meet in this format and that I cannot welcome you here in Bishkek. I hope we are very soon over this uh, lockdown period and we can continue having such gatherings, such workshops and conference on the ground here at our present premises at the academy and to have a chance to also get to know each other on a more personal level. For now, we have to do it in this format and I welcome you all to this uh, international workshop. The Belt and Road Initiative has been a topic of growing importance also to the OSC Academy's activities, projects and programs in the last years. That's not least due to the fact that the OSC itself has yeah, an increasing interest in understanding the activities of China and its global outreach. With China not listing as one of the participating states of the OSC, the OSC has been looking for alternative ways to, to, to analyze, to interpret and to understand what's going on. And uh, in particular, this interest concerns, of course, the two main directions of activities of the, of the OSC, that is security and development. One of the implications has been the question for democracy and its promotion or curtailment here in Central Asia. I'm glad that, yeah, as it says in the abstract, almost 10 years after the announcement, the initiation of the Belt and Road Initiative, that we come together in this group to discuss what the Belt and Road Initiative has achieved, what it actually is, what it stands for, and what its consequences are. I would like to express my thanks, my gratitude for those who have organized this event. First and foremost, of course, our gratitude goes to Anja, Professor Anja Mir, and to Professor Britta Reifen, who have been organizing this uh, international workshop. Anja is our OEC or DAD professor at the Academy. Britta Weifen is the chair of the research committee of the International Political Science at the, um, Association. Uh, that deals with questions of the quality of democracy. To both of you, our gratitude for setting up this reputed workshop with us, the Academy as a host. I also would like to thank Professors Pomfret, Professor Holbig and Professor Schatz for their contribution in form of the keynote lectures that they will deliver to this conference. Last but not least, I'm thankful to all of those who have contributed with their um, papers, who serve as moderators and as discussants to make the next three days, I hope, a very exciting exchange about China's role in wider Eurasia. With that, I already come to an end. Thank you so much for being with us and I hand over to the two organizers for further introductory remarks. Anja, Rita. Thank you, Alexander. Um, we'll take this uh, on board and uh, aim, of course, to make this uh, a very fruitful uh, workshop and discussions. Uh, from our side, as Alexander has uh, mentioned, this is a workshop event by the Research Committee 34 on Quality of Democracy. Britta is the chair of this research committee and she will say, a few more words about uh, what this research committee is doing otherwise apart from this conference and I'm currently based here in Bishkek at the OBC Academy as a DID professor for a couple of years in this field also of politics, democracy, research, etc. 
And uh, the topic on um, is China and China's Belt and Road Initiative, which started in 2013, a curse or blessing. When we set up this, um, the, the call for papers about a year ago, um, we weren't really sure uh, what kind of resonance and responses we would get to this because China, and this is also what we will start today with, um, is predominantly known in, in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative as uh, um, it's, it's known as an initiative that forces economic development, infrastructural projects. It's mostly seen in the context of economic development. And this is also how we will start today uh, of this three day workshop, more with uh, sort of China being sort of a, almost a development agent and an economic agent, an infrastructural agent. But what kind of um, consequences does have the, in, the initiatives even on the field of political systems, political regimes, and overall in the field of uh, democracy. Because what we have seen here over the past decade since the launch of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, in and around 2013 is a lot of um, social movements, civil society movements, which are often connected to the initiatives actually that come from, from the Belt and Road Initiative, starting from protest movements, but also empowerment uh, of, of civil societies, etc. And we will look at this over the three days. Um, I want to say a few more words about uh, sort of uh, yeah, housekeeping uh, rules for this workshop. As many of you already see, uh, we have uh, quite a large audience apart from the speakers. We have over 200 registrations for this workshop. So that is actually not the typical workshop character when you think about workshops having two or 30, 20 or 30 people at the most. Um, but we have a rather wide uh, audience from around the world uh, joining us over the three days. Not everybody will be joining, of course, at the same time. Some have selected certain topics. And uh, we have um, uh, about uh, sort of 20 people who will actively participate as speakers. You will be seeing that um, this workshop is recorded for internal use only. There is um, that will not go automatically online or on YouTube, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We will make the offer, nevertheless, after the conference. Those of you, particularly the keynote speakers, I hope, will agree on having their presentations um, also be shared on our website on YouTube. The presentations of the keynote speakers will be approximately 30 minutes, and there is time for question and answers, whereas the presentations by our speakers will be uh, 12 minutes, um, 10 to 12 minutes, and then, of course, followed by discussions. But this is, in a way, sort of a semi-internal thing. And of course, we will not publish anything um, online without any consent of the, of the participants or the speakers, let alone. So please be assured this is only for those who have registered. We had some concerns um, the last days and right, so and I hope I can clarify uh, it with this. So work in progress that doesn't want to be published um, will not be published. Um, so, and I want to hand over after these housekeeping rules uh, to Britta. Britta, you have the floor uh, telling us a bit more about the research committee. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, and good morning, everybody. And I'm very happy to um, see you all, well, more or less, in this virtual format. And uh, as Alexander Voltos has mentioned, I also personally would have much more preferred to be able to travel to Bishkek and to meet you all personally uh, than sitting at home at my desk and uh, moderating and participating in this workshop. Um, and I think many of us, and actually when we started to plan this workshop, about nine, 10 months ago, we were, well, and by that time I had already held a workshop of the research committee uh, that I will talk about shortly online. And we were expecting that this year it would be possible again to hold a workshop face-to-face. Uh, -face. But as you all know, things have not developed as we all hoped. And uh, the pandemic is extending a little bit longer um, than we all expected and hoped. 
Um, so no promises about next year, <laughs> but for today we're gonna and the next three days we're gonna manage like this. And I think this is still also has an advantage of making it possible for more people to follow and join the meeting online who otherwise would not have had the opportunity to travel um, to Bishkek and, and just to participate, just to listen to a few presentations. So that, of course, is the positive side. Um, so turning to the research committee. So research committee uh, 34, Quality of Democracy, uh, is one of the dozens of research committees of the International Political Science Association. Um, that uh, was also affected by the pandemic in that it was supposed to hold its uh, biannual world conference last year uh, in July, which was then postponed to this year. And again, uh, now it's going to be held online um, upon decision of the, of the board. Um, which in theory could already have done last year, right? But again, they also have were in the same mood as we were thinking that this year all uh, face-to-face events would once again be possible. Now, the research committee has uh, a history of more or less uh, 10 years, I think. I think it was informally founded in 2011 and then formalized in 2012 at the Wor then World Congress, I think in Madrid. Um, of the International Political Science Association and was initiated by colleagues interested in looking at what after the third wave of democratization that brought a lot of optimism and a lot of research into questions uh, regarding determinants of democracy, causes of democratization and democratic transitions. Um, the research committee looked at uh, a little bit more like um, the cases that uh, were not performing as successful as one would have expected in the initial optimism of the third wave of democracy and looked at uh, questions of, well, quality of democracy, as the name says, um, like in addition to elections, what other char characteristics should democratic regimes have? How can we can conceptualize them? So there has also a lot of work has been done about measurement of democracy, how to distinguish democracies, how to rank democracies, if you want. And in recent years, this had, it has expanded even further, um, looking at the fact that even democracies that were thought to be established and consolidated, um, their challenges have arisen and the contestations have emerged. And even on the domestic level, it's no longer as clear as it was 10 or 20 years ago um, that democracy is the best possible system. Uh, the rise of populism, the rise of Trump, the rise of some right-wing populist parties in Europe, just being mentioned as a few examples. And then we look when we look to the global south, we look at Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India. All of them have been singled out as populist leaders that um, have challenged previous democratic developments in their countries. Um, now, and that has increasingly also become a topic of the research committee in the past few years uh, at the World Congress in Australia in 2018, where I was actually elected um, to the board of the research committee. We had a panel on the crisis of democracy um, and um, we, we've also organized um, workshops in the past, looking at democracy in Latin America, for example. Um, and um, I think it's now about time that we look at other world regions as well and move from the strong focus on Europe and Latin America that has often been quite dominant in democratization research and look at other world regions as well. So the research committee basically um, is in charge of organizing um, panels at the bigger IPSA conferences, but then is also encouraged to organize smaller events, workshops or meetings uh, in between the World Congresses. And um, I've organized, I've, I've become actually chair um, in the middle of the road. I was elected, as I said, to the board as vice chair originally in 2018. And the then chair resigned in 2019. And then kind of I succeeded her um, to become the chair. 
Um, and in this capacity, I already organized a workshop comparable to this one um, in terms of um, size and format last year when I was still based uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and this was on rising democracies interrupted. So also looking at emerging democracies, young democracies from different world regions um, that have um, like 10 or 15 years ago been celebrated as rising democracies that might even become active in democracy promotion at some point and that have then recently seen backsliding. And again, this had originally been planned as a workshop on the spot in Sao Paulo. Uh, was supposed to be a bit of my last event there because I was there as a visiting professor, also a day day visiting professor like Anja is now at the OSCE Academy in Bishkek. Um, and this position, this uh, my tenure, my time there was coming to an end. And so this was uh, an idea, to, the, the idea was to finish it up with a nice event. And it was a nice event actually. And I think some of the participants of the event also signed up for this year's event. And that is also why we had this idea of repeating this experience and doing another workshop. Um, Anja actually proposed the topic now that she is based in Bishkek and has some insights into what is happening in Central Asia and Eurasia more widely. Um, she had the idea of actually looking at the development of political regimes in Eurasia and the impact that China might have directly or indirectly on these developments in the regions and sometimes also, well, unexpectedly or counterintuitively. And I hope that we can explore this further um, during the workshop. Just saying a few words about myself, I've kind of mentioned in passing already. Um, I'm originally German also and worked a long time at different universities in Germany, including the University of Konstanz, uh, from where I then moved to Brazil in 2014 uh, and lived six years there on different positions as visiting professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and after my period there has come to an end in July last year, um, I have now moved uh, to the United Kingdom and uh, hold a position as a senior lecturer uh, at the Open University, which is based in Milton Keynes, about 80 kilometers north of London. So just that you can kind of geographically locate where I am right now. Um, and my work has always been related to questions of democratization uh, and more recently the prices of democracy. And I've also worked to quite some extent on the role of regional organizations um, and specifically the role of regional organizations in reacting to crisis of democracy or in supporting democracy, defending democracy, protecting democracy um, in their own member countries. Um, so this is kind of my connection to this topic. Um, so I'm not an expert in China, <laughs> I have to say. I've been more focusing on Latin America and Europe, but always like with a very strong comparative focus and look towards and interest in other world regions. And therefore, I'm very grateful to Anya that she has proposed this topic. Um, and as Anya already mentioned, when we launched the call for papers, in June, I think it was last year, uh, we were not sure how much it was how much it would resonate uh, with people because we knew that in Germany, which is kind of the political science scene that we do both know very well, uh, that there are not too many people working on this topic. Um, so we didn't know how many feedback, how many replies we would get. However, that it was a considerable amount of paper submissions and we actually had to select uh, among the ones that were submitted. And um, so we hope um, that you will like <laughs> the choices that we made and you will be happy with the paper. And also, of course, um, as we said, this is a workshop, it will be composed of presentations and the panels that were selected in response to the call for papers and uh, three longer keynote lectures of people that are experts on the topic and that we invited uh, on purpose. Um, and so I hope that both if you participate as speaker, you will benefit from the feedback, from the exchange um, that you get here. 
and um, also if you participate in the audience that you will receive new insights and inspirations for your own work. Without much further ado, I would actually uh, hand over to uh, Richard Pomfret, our first keynote speaker, and I could have not thought of anybody uh, better to, to address uh, this first round of panels uh, than uh, Richard Pomfret, who uh, for many that work in the Eurasian uh, area is of course uh, known. Um, he has published uh, several books and of course numerous articles, particularly on the economic development and also the future of the economic development in Central Asia in particular, but he is also known wider, or he, he's uh, known wider also in the field of uh, China's Belt and Road Initiatives uh, to many of the scholars. And uh, yes, I'm very, very happy he can join us today from Australia. I know, Richard, you really wanted to make your way here to Bishkek. You know the region, of course, well. You know Bishkek very well. And I promise you we'll make everything possible that this will be possible again face to face in the near future to have you actually here. But today, I think it's already a little bit more in the afternoon, evening for you in Adelaide, Australia. You're joining us from Adelaide, Australia. You are the professor of economics at the University of Adelaide. You have the floor, the future impact of Brie in Eurasia. Um, now, first of all, I was going to start off with a warning that this is mainly, as we've just heard from Brigitte, um, a conference with political scientists talking about um, democracy. And the warning is that I'm an economist and I'm going to be talking about the economics of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think that, that is, a, as um, Anya suggests, I think that's probably a good way to start, though, because the sustainability of a BRI, I think, will very clearly depend upon its um, economic viability. Uh, and I'm going to argue that the, the belt portion, at least, of the, of the BRI um, has very strong economic foundations. I think it will have a durable um, impact on Eurasia, including Central Asia, which will be the main focus of my, my talk. And the prime evidence I'm going to give, this isn't a, a mystery presentation, the prime evidence that I'm going to give is that there has been a, a substantial growth of um, rail traffic between Europe and China over the last decade. And that really is sort of suggests to me the, the strong economic basis. Um, also mention a, a, a little bit of an economist and a political scientist is, um, the economists always say, we're saying happens there are winners and losers, but we tend to assume that they won't balance out, um, that if there's more opportunity for, for exchange and trade, it will be positive sum even with winners and losers. Um, whereas I, I suspect that some of the political scientists are a bit more, they're used to working on issues to do with power and um, tend to be a bit more zero sum and a little um, concerned that the, event, about the negative effects. So I'll try to start off on an optimistic note. What I want to do in the talk is a brief outline. I want to start off by talking about the, the, the phases of economic development in Central Asia since 1991. And I think this is important because we, we very much um, are in the region is very much influenced by the way it's got to where it is today. And for me, there very clearly have been three different phases in this economic development. The 1990s you know, it was a decade of uh, nation building. It was a decade of transition from central planning. Um, it was in many ways an unexpected shock with the, the rapid dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it was a decade that was very harsh for many people in Central Asia. In the next 15 years from 1999 to 2014, we were dominated by the resource boom, you know, particularly the um, the countries that had oil and gas, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan or Russia as well, um, obviously experienced very rapid economic growth, but all through the region, there was fairly substantial economic growth in um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, clearly related a bit to, to migrant workers with many um, social issues. Well, but just from the economic perspective, that was a period of some prosperity and the period clearly ended the, phase win at the moment in 2014 when the, the resource boom ended and there was some uncertainty, volatility in the economy, um, but general acceptance that there needed to be a new economic strategy aimed at diversification away for, from the narrow resource base. So that's kind of the general background to the region. The second thing I want to talk about 
is the Eurasian land bridge. I want to talk about the origins of the rail connections between Europe and, and East Asia um, that developed in 2011 and have flourished over the last decade. In general, I want to talk about this by referring to the land bridge as something that's happened a little bit from the bottom up and contrast to the BRI, although clearly it's um, very much, very similar to, much related to the belt portion of the BRI. And I particularly want to look at the impact of the uh, COVID pandemic on this. The third point going from that is to look at the connection between the rail connectivity and the Belt and Road Initiative more broadly considered. And finally, look at the, the consequences of this increased connectivity. I'll say very little about the last point, although I recognize this is the thing we're probably most interested in. Um, as Anya suggested, this is also, I think, the most controversial part about what, what, what is the, the effect. And I'll be really happy to talk about it in the, the question and answer time. Um, so moving forward to going into a bit more detail about this, I think the, the patterns of economic development have been really important because of the optimism about what would happen with the end of central planning, the end of communism, the emergence of a new nation state, which I think um, led to a lot of disillusionment during the 1990s. And I think we have substantial evidence in Central Asia as well, and more evidence in, in Russia, that when we look at what's happening today, that, that this has had a big impact, that the generation that went through that decade and are now in their 50s, um, tend to have a fairly negative attitude towards democracy, towards the market economy. As a younger generation, I think it's um, is more positive on this, but I think that difference between generations, uh, mediated a bit by you know, the people, the wealthy people tend to be a, a little more cautious about democracy and further change, better educated people are more enthusiastic. These um, attitudes, I think, coming out of the past and out of the um, the unequal distribution of assets, um, obvious um, increase in inequality, they underlie, uh, I think, to a considerable extent, the rise of populism that, that Brigitte just, just mentioned, and which we, we're seeing you know, most obviously in Central Asia, in, in Bishkek in recent months. Um, so we've got a, a, a situation where the economists, I mean, they grew substantially in the second period during the boom. You know, we, we see, um, I guess this is the one slide I, I wish I could show you as a slide, but we see that the GDP per capita in Kazakhstan, you know, increased from you know $1,200 in, in US dollars, increased from $1,200 in 2000 to $12,000 in 2014. That's a huge increase. It then falls to $7,500 in, in 2015, 2016, sorry, before recovering back to just under um, $10,000 dollars today. Now, these are huge swings, you know, the huge um, increase in living standards, then a, you know, a lot of um, instability in the last five years. So what, although I talk about this um, current period that's been since 2015, it's five years, so we're really unsure, you know, what is going on in this period at the moment. We, we know there are statements about economic diversity being a good thing and what governments want to do, how serious they are about it, we're not completely sure. Obviously complicated by changes in precedent in, the, in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and most recently in, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, so we're not completely sure what's, um, what's really going on, which countries will take advantage of the, or which countries will, I take advantage of probably the wrong word, which countries will manage to move beyond dependence on, on resources or on remittances and diversify their economies. Um, what are the prospects of economic reform? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, well, certainly as an economist, I find it hard, difficult to say with, with any um, certainty about, um, about this. Um, one thing I think is a positive thing is when we look at the, the leadership in the five Central Asian countries, you know, there's clearly been a generational shift comparing 1991 to 2021. In 1991, all of the presidents uh, um, were people who had been um, in the 50s at the time of independence. I'm, think, I'm old enough to, think to say that by the time people get into their 50s, yeah, they become a little less open to new ideas, a little less more cautious. When we look at the, um, the presidents today, these are all people who were maybe um, in the late 20s, or early 30s in 1991. They've spent almost all, most of their adult lives 
in the, the market-based economy, um, in the, uh, not in, in the Soviet Union. So I have some optimism that there will be um, positive responses through economic reform to be able to take advantage of the opportunities to diversify their economies, but it could vary from country to country. What do I mean by the opportunities to diversify their economies? Well, I think one of the, the main changes I've observed over the, the last 30 years in looking at the economic prospects is that starting in the 1990s and continuing into the early 2000s, there was very little diversification economies. The existing resource base from the Soviet era, cotton, oil and gas, minerals, that continued to be a, a benefit. These were things that were relatively easy to export. Oil and gas, maybe you needed to construct pipelines and so on. But that was the basis of the economies. And not much happened beyond that. Oh, wow. Um, what's happening here? Uh, I've got a map here. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and the story was that the countries were landlocked. And that was their main problem. I think during the 2000s, 2005, 2006, so a couple of fairly major projects by the Asian Development Bank and by the UNDP, arguing that landlocked, being landlocked is not per se a big problem. What was the problem? That it was very difficult and expensive to engage in international trade. That didn't stop trade in the, um, in the primary products, but it did make it really um, not much incentive to develop new export products. Um, and it's fairly clear if you look at Europe, I mean, it's not been a problem for, for Switzerland or Slovakia being landlocked because they had um, neighbours who were, were wealthy and well connected. And the big change, I think, over the last 15 years for Central Asia is these connections with the neighbours, particularly China, Russia and Europe, um, have, have improved considerably. And the table that I want to show about this is how much... Um, the volume of traffic on these um, connections in the map that I have on the screen now, how rapidly that has grown. It really starts in, 20, in 2011. You know, why did it start in 2011? It started then because you know, car firms in, in Germany wanted to send components to their assembly plant in China. They've been doing that in 2007, 2008, 2009, along the Trans-Siberian Railway on trains specially commissioned, which didn't have much wider effect because they, they were just commissioned by Volkswagen and BMW. Also, by 2011, there'd been a Chinese policy to shift um, activity inland from the coastal provinces, to shift activity to um, Chongqing and Chengdu in the West. And um, we see some very large investments there by Foxconn, who assemble Apple products, by HP with printers, by Acer, on computers by Intel for semiconductors. They had planned to ship their products up the Yangtze River to, to Shanghai and then to, to the rest of the world. The, Shang, the Shanxi quickly got congested and an alternative was to send them by rail from Chongqing across Kazakhstan, um, Russia, Belarus, Poland to Duisburg. And that is really the, 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 the key issue with once these um, rail companies agreed on providing a service um, and it became three times a week and by 2016 a daily service. This became open to many more customers and it, it was a, a nice virtuous circle that um, ever comes straight forwarders or, or courier companies like um, DHL, FedEx or, or UPS or new companies come, we're offering new services, you know, park container services, they put together a container for you, refrigerated containers, onward um, uh, logistics from Duisburg or, or, or from Chongqing. And this, the amount of trade, you know, then started to grow rapidly, as did the number of destinations. So by 2017, there were at least 30 Chinese cities had trains going to Europe, and at least 30 European cities had trains going to, to China. And, you know, that, diversity you know, made this attractive to many more customers. You know, the table I, I had in my slides was that by um, 2015, starting from virtually zero in 2010, by 2015 there were 46,000 containers a year going on, on this rail connection between China and, um, and Europe. 
by 2019, it was 333,000 containers, you know, very rapid growth. And what's even more striking is that last year, the number went from 333,000 to 547,000. Yeah. So a huge increase, yeah, despite the disruption of COVID. Yeah. Um, so what, what's happening here? What, why is this happening? Why, why is it uh, uh, so attractive? Well, a lot of it is to do with the major development in international trade over the last 30 or 40 years. There's been increased fragmentation of production along um, value chains, often referred to as global value chains, but more commonly, you know, regional value chains in Europe or, or in Asia. Um, so it's, it's hard to know exactly where a product is made, you know, a, a car, a, a Volkswagen car has got components from all across Europe, um, or if it's assembled in, um, in China, it's got components coming from Europe and many other places. Um, so we've got this phenomenon of global value chains, and the crucial thing for global value chains is that you have, uh, you don't keep inventories. You want to move goods swiftly from to the next stage of production. And if you're crossing international borders, you want no delay, no tariffs, et cetera. And that, that is a phenomenon that, that has been going on, you know, especially in Europe and in East Asia. But the, the rail links are linking these two regions together. They are for the car makers, for the electronics companies. They're much more attractive than sending the products by, by sea that would take 45 to 50 days when you can send it in 15 days from, um, from Chongqing to Duisburg. And not only is it faster, it's more reliable because boats can hit bad weather, they can hit pirates, so they can have congestion getting through the Suez Canal. It's, these trains run to a timetable. Um, they, I don't particularly want to make any German jokes here, but having the, the Deutsche Bahn as part of the thing maybe helps to ensure that the trains do run on, on time. Um, so it's a, you have a big advantage for these um, fragmented um, production chains. And so how, how does that relate to um, the, the Central Asian countries' ability to um, participate in these and diversify their, their trade? Well, the rail lines run through Central Asia. They don't stop at the moment. You know, so that's, that's got some benefits. I mean, Kazakhstan gets maybe a billion dollars of um, transit fees each year um, from it. But the opportunity is that with the rail track there, um, simplification of procedures for crossing borders, then it could reduce the cost of, um, uh, of producing exports um, beyond the, the primary product base. Um, how is that related to, to the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, essentially the Belt part of the BRI is trying to do the same thing. Um, yeah, I focus on the land bridge because that really gets going in 2011. The Silk Road Economic Belt is only announced in, in 2013. It then becomes part of One Belt, One Road. It then becomes the, the BRI. You know, partly because there are lots of belts, as we can see from the, the map that, that's on, on the screen. But they're clearly you know, complementary, that these rail routes, uh, um, the global infrastructure um, network that we've got on the screen now, it's exact, that the, the darker lines, these lines going across Central Asia to Europe or to Iran, um, these lines are what I was calling the Eurasian land bridge. Equally, they could be called the belt portion of the, of the BRI. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the effectiveness of the land bridge has, I think, really um, gives us some sense of feeling that the belt part of the Belt and Road Initiative, this is going to continue, it's going to be successful. Yeah. We see some slight differences, yeah, most of the, um, the current traffic along the land bridge, it, it can start different places in China, but it goes on the route through Kazakhstan, through Russia, um, through Belarus, and through Poland. It may stop at Łódź, which has become a, 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 a hub for, for Eastern Europe, or it may go on you know, to Duisburg or to Madrid or, or wherever. Um, one of the things that is clear from the start of, of, of China's BRI, the official maps that were coming out as far back as 2014, emphasized the route going south of the Caspian Sea. Yeah. This is important to think why. You know, why does China want an alternative route? Well, because you don't want to be dependent on Russia or on Iran 
as they, they could potentially, or any of the transit countries could potentially, you know, try to put up the cost of transport uh, thinking they've got a captive um, uh, market. Um, so there, there is this incentive to develop um, alternatives. Um, it's also one thing that's clear, maybe, yeah, I think it is clear on this map, when China first opened the route to Iran, it, it happened when the UN eased sanctions on Iran at the beginning of 2016. Very quickly, China sent the first train to Tehran and it went through Kazakhstan, right across to the Caspian Sea, then down through Turkmenistan to Tehran. Why does it go on that circuitous route instead of you know, cutting across the hypotenuse here? Well, because in 2016, Uzbekistan was a difficult country to cross. They had very uh, rigid rules on transit. You had very thorough customs inspections when you entered a leper country. The, um, the government would not respect you know, the seals on a, a train that's just um, traveling through, through. So it's very clear that I think to the Uzbek authorities, it was very clear, these are the costs if you um, want to try to protect your borders by, by more um, regulations. And since 2017, um, with a new president and a more open attitude towards um, trade and transit, that this more direct route through Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan to, um, uh, uh, to Iran is being used. Yeah. So there is a, a, um, something that's important there for Central Asia is this diversity of routes is of interesting to the different countries, to, um, uh, yeah, for, if everything was going by the Kazakhstan route to Russia, it's not much interest to the, the four seven Central Asian countries. But when there's an alternative route going through um, Uzbekistan uh, and Turkmenistan, this opens up greater options for the region. I'd also very briefly mention this um, line that's coming here down from Urumqi to, um, to Kashi, to Kashgar, which is the most westernmost point on the Chinese rail system. Kashgar is only a couple of hundred kilometers from Uzbekistan, but there's no connection there. So China and Uzbekistan would very much like the, this connection to happen. Kyrgyzstan is very reluctant to be involved in taking a loan to build the connection because the, the estimated cost is about equal to Kyrgyzstan's GDP. So this is a prime um, exhibit I mean, in concerns about debt dependence from the BRI, that if um, Kyrgyzstan were to take a loan, build this line, it's per perhaps, not likely that they could pay back the loan because it goes through a, night, um, a not very populated part of the country um, would not raise much in revenue in business apart from the transit revenues. So um, I think we, we can see you know, some of the, the potential benefits from having a denser network, having more options for, for trade. At the same time, we can see that there could be some p potential costs of um, if involved, trying to get involved um, um, Richard, I think we've lost you. You are muted and frozen, at least the picture. Um, yeah, now you're um, back. Yes. Oh. Can you please repeat the last minute or so? That would be great. Did, did you get the stuff about Kyrgyzstan and the rail link to Uzbekistan and debt dependence? Did you hear that? Yes, the debt dependence was sort of the last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, fine. Yeah. So um, I think I'll, I'll start to kind of wind up at this point, um, which well, it may take five or 10 minutes. Um, you know, what can we say in all this about the, the prospects of Central Asia? Um, I think within the region, there is widespread recognition of the need for economic diversification if the national economies are to prosper. Um, that improved infrastructure, as in the map that's on your screen, um, really has allayed the cost of landlockedness. Just being landlocked is not really, you know, it's, a, it's an issue, but it's not really the, the major problem. The major problem is whether a country can have, create conditions that, that encourage new businesses to start, and can create conditions where the costs of trading across borders are as low as possible. Um, I mean, the positive side for this is that the new current generation of leaders have uh, been mostly spent their adult lives in, in post-centrally planned e economies. I think that's a positive factor. Um, the negative factor, I think, is that there are many in the elites who, have, who benefit from the semi-reformed economic 
economies and they don't particularly want um, more competition and, and more trade. So it really is a bit um, uncertain where, what will happen. Maybe some countries will be participating actively and some countries less so. Moving on more directly to the subject matter of the, the conference, you know, what can we say about the BRI? Well, as I started off, I think the sustainability of the BRI depends crucially on its um, economic viability. And I think the, that is very strong, that the, um, the belt component of the BRI is based on you know, really um, strong uh, economic fundamentals, the benefits of linking by rail um, the economies of Europe and to China um, this is, um, are, are really strong. Why has it been stronger during COVID? Why did we have a big increase in the um, volume of traffic you know, from what, 330? Uh, 1,000 containers to 550,000 containers, a you know, huge one-year increase when you know, we tend to think economic conditions were not so great. The reason was that COVID emphasized the benefits of using rail for transport for its speed and reliability. You know, ships were stuck in the wrong place because crews were having to go through and quarantine. Um, you know, there's a substantial disruption to, to maritime trade that en encouraged um, businesses, producers to try to um, look at what was offered on the rail service and it worked quite well. I mean, we've got all kinds of stories of, you know, uh, Credit Lyonnais in, in, in France needed a, an ATM urgently. So they got the producer in China to send it by rail and it was there and installed within two weeks. Um, yes, yeah, so the, 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 the trigger of COVID was to um, highlight the potential of using this you know, rail as an efficient in terms of um, time and certainty, a, a bit higher cost than, than C, but not that much. Um, so it underlied the, the benefits of this um, mode, mode of transport. So I think the, when we talk about the land bridge or the BRI, there's providing a window opportunity for Central Asian countries. Why does the BRI matter over and above the land bridge? Well, I think first of all, it, it signals you know, strong Chinese support for rail links and particularly for multiple links, as I mentioned, going you know, to Iran and the Middle East as, as well as going, going to Europe. Um, it also, um, China signals that it has uh, funding through the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and other financial institutions um, to help uh, provide infrastructure at key points. Uh, and that, as I mentioned, the, the link between Kashi and Uzbekistan through, through Kyrgyzstan, I think it would be a, a key example of that. Um, remembering that all uh, at these border crossing points, when you cross from China to um, Central Asia or Russia, you know, there is a change of gauge. You need thing, investment in the facilities to um, speed up this um, shift from the, the standard gauge to the Russian gauge. And again, at the um, going from Belarus to Poland. Now, the technology is there. It takes about 40 minutes on the China-Kazakhstan border for a 40 um, container train to switch from one gauge to the other. But it takes some investment. Um, what else to say? Well, I mean, as far as the, the Central Asian countries are concerned, whether they take advantage of that window opportunity really depends upon domestic conditions. So I think we, we have a, a balance in my view, between the BRI providing an opportunity, but whether you get through that opportunity, I talk about a window opportunity, when you get through the window, um, depends really on domestic changes. And in that process, you know, there will clearly be impacts on the domestic um, communities, economic, political system. There will be winners and losers. And those um, consequences are what I'm assuming will be analysed in much of this um, conference, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say about that. And we will uh, move on to Pascal Up, who is going to talk about the impact of the Belt and Road Initiatives on conflict states. Pascal, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, and a pleasure to be talking about this topic to you guys today. Um, so, first of all, as already mentioned, um, the main scope of um, our project, which is actually um, going to res result in a report that's going to come out next week and that I would be happy to share with all of you who are interested, 
um, was mainly on conflict dynamics, uh, not on democratization. Um, but I believe that um, the research we did also has some salient aspects in that regard. And those are the points which I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, first of all, I believe our report is pretty complementary to the work which Marketa just introduced because it's not uh, quantitative, but uh, case study based. And we had a total of four case studies, uh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Kyrgyzstan and Uganda. The last of which I believe is outside of the geographic scope of this conference. But I'm going to be presenting the cases of uh, Pakistan and Myanmar. And I'm actually very happy that one of my co-authors, Ilya Jones from Safer World, was also uh, able to join us today. And he's going to cover uh, Kyrgyzstan in a few minutes. Um, so when we look at Pakistan and Myanmar, we found some commonalities that I believe applied both to the democratization as well as the conflict aspect. So both of these are multi-ethnic and post-colonial states with severe levels of ongoing inter-ethnic or in the case of Pakistan, also sectarian violence. So they have a very long history of uh, center periphery tensions. There's, there's a majority ethnicity, the Bamar in the case of Myanmar or um, the Punjabis in the case of Pakistan, that has historically held the most power in those countries and a range of minority groups that have been left out. And that is uh, in a very, very simplified way, the root cause of many of the conflicts which we're seeing there. Um, there's also, apart from the um, yeah, great. Um, that's also apart from the power sharing aspect, also pronounced developmental differences. So the map which you're seeing right now um, is a district level HDI figures for Pakistan. So green denotes higher levels of development and red lower levels. And overlaid on that is a map of um, BRI or so-called CPEC, that's the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project. So CPEC in its initial stage had two priorities. Um, the first one of which was connectivity, that's shown here in yellow. And the second one was uh, electricity generation, so power plants, which are the blue triangles. And as you can see, those projects are heavily clustered in areas of Pakistan that are already comparatively highly developed. So that's um, what you may be able to make out uh, Karachi in the south and uh, Lahore and Islamabad um, more towards the northeast. And if you look at the red areas in this map, those are the um, peripheral areas of Pakistan that are uh, mainly populated by minorities. Um, that is Balochistan in the southwest and um, the Pashto areas on the border to Afghanistan. And as you can see, that's actually where the least CPEC related development took place. Um, so what happened there? Um, this, this is actually something where CPEC very directly interacted with uh, local politics in Pakistan and also had an impact on the country's democratic structures. So Pakistan officially has a, a federal government. That means that lower levels of government are supposed to have a say also in, in how these um, projects are being designed. Um, but that kind of broke down in the case of CPEC. Um, so in a nutshell, you had multiple institutions that were supposed to give lower levels of government the kind of input to also have their priorities heard. But that, for a variety of reasons that I think I can only very briefly summarize here, didn't happen. Um, and that resulted in a situation where uh, we also saw an overall loss of trust in these democratic institutions. So in national level parties, in uh, all party conferences, in power sharing agreements, and so on. And a lot of that had to do that I think we had a two level game um, that also involved negotiations with the Chinese side and the Pakistani government actually um, tried to initially pitch projects that were not, not economically viable or at least could not be, uh, they could not reach agreement on with the Chinese. So, and as a result, you had this uh, kind of unsatisfying situation where the areas of Pakistan that were the most in need of development got the least, uh, least amount of projects. And that's actually, a crucial factor here. The complaints about CPEC in Pakistan are not, not so much about uh, negative effects of projects, but they come mainly from groups that would have liked to see some of them, but didn't get any. Um, when we move on to the case of Myanmar, Myanmar is um, very different in some regards, um, also similar in others. Um, it's similar in that you also had uh, a long history of Chinese investments, especially in the infrastructure sector. Um, that was mainly due to the uh, economic closing off of the country during military rule. Um, this, this kind of changed a little bit during democratization, but China remained a major player in the country. 
Um, so in here you saw some pretty interesting dynamics um, because China pa and Pakistan relations had actually been relatively good um, on various levels, um, but the development of CPAC eventually resulted in a, a stronger role for the military. That's something which I should have mentioned is also a common factor between the two countries, that civil military relations are very tense and the military has historically had a large um, political influence. Um, so in Pakistan, this, this kind of shifted towards a gradually increasing uh, involvement of the military, eventually culminating in the creation of a new so-called uh, CPEC authority that is now supposed to play a major role in project selection, and that is basically staffed by military personnel. Uh, in Myanmar, under democratic transition, you had kind of an opposite trend. Um, so here, it was the incoming democratic administration, especially under the National League of Democracy and Aung San Suu Kyi, um, that actually was, was a driver of um, uh, uh, Myanmar's involvement in the BRI. And the reason for that was that um, basically the NLD had a much greater legitimacy than any of the military governments or quasi-civilian military-backed governments that preceded it. Um, and this is why uh, it actually was a very attractive partner to China. And I believe when you look at the most recent events, the coup, um, we actually have a separate text on that one coming out today or also early next week. Um, this is something where Chinese plans for the country were actively disrupted by um, the turn away from democratization and turn towards autocracy. Um, I also have some general conclusions about that. But before I get to that, um, I would actually like to, uh, to pass the microphone to Ilya, who is going to cover the case of Kyrgyzstan, which I can imagine you guys are also very interested in. Great, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, very happy to be joining you today. Uh, my name is Ilya Jones. I'm the Regional Conflict and Security Advisor uh, for Central Asia at Safer World, uh, which is a peacebuilding organization uh, with projects um, in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan as well. Um, I'm actually usually based in Bishkek, uh, so I may have crossed paths with, um, with some of you there, but uh, for the moment I happen to be in the US. Um, and as uh, Pascal mentioned, I contributed to the Kyrgyzstan um, chapter uh, case study of the report. Um, so I only have a few minutes, so I'll just talk through some of the main points, um, which I'm sure will be picked up in more detail in the Central Asia sessions uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, and yeah, as, as was mentioned, the report itself mainly focused on conflict dynamics and local level impacts of Chinese investments. Um, but I'll just pull out a few uh, points that are more relevant to uh, governance aspects. Um, and since many of you are in Bishkek, I assume um, already quite familiar with, with the context, so I won't go into much background. Um, but as you know, uh, China has seen a, a rapidly growing uh, role uh, in the economic sphere in Kyrgyzstan, uh, with many of its projects and investments bringing various benefits and challenges. Um, just to outline a few of those benefits, many of our interviewees for this uh, research cited, um, you know, jobs, increased revenues for some businesses, um, skills programs, uh, social benefit packages, and um, taxes going to local budgets. Um, but despite these benefits, um, the public is largely still quite opposed to Chinese investments and uh, generally has uh, a negative view um, of China in general. Um, and this is visible in a few ways. Uh, for example, um, you know, on the Oxus Society's uh, protest database, uh, we counted that there were dozens of uh, protests in Kyrgyzstan in the last year, few years that were in some way um, related to China. Um, not all related to investments necessarily, but um, they're kind of an indicator of the level of public uh, skepticism and mistrust. Um, and a lot of the reasons for this relate to issues I mentioned earlier on impacts on local communities, but there are some um, related to governance more generally as well. Um, <clears throat> so for example, um, a perception of investments uh, feeding into corruption. Uh, so in, in some of our interviews, it came out that uh, Chinese actors are largely willing to play by um, local rules, by paying bribes, and so local politicians or officials can benefit from this um, or find other sources of income uh, from these projects. Um, and it doesn't help that uh, these deals are often struck um, directly between companies and um, local officials with uh, limited consultation um, with local populations and not very much communication on what the projects involve in many cases. Um, and there have been some high profile cases that 
illustrate this, uh, such as the uh, thermal plant in Bishkek, uh, where Chinese financing was seen to enrich elites and around which there were some uh, corruption scandals. Um, and when the plant itself <clears throat> failed a few years ago in the middle of winter, this kind of created this uh, or contributed even more to this perception of uh, funds being channeled into uh, these projects that don't have many benefits um, for regular people. Um, and this is kind of in, in contrast to the position of um, uh, some of the officials. So there's quite a divide, I think, um, in perceptions of Chinese investments where government officials are largely supportive of such investments and see them as an important source of funding for their budgets or sometimes personally. Um, they don't always take this position publicly because uh, it can be controversial, um, but many are seen to benefit uh, from these deals. And on the other hand, the public, uh, which is largely quite opposed to them. And so this creates another point of um, kind of contention between uh, people and their representatives, um, which you know contributes to protests and feelings of discontent and not having much say over the decisions that affect their lives. Um, and I think another important point to mention is the long-held belief of um, you know, China threatening Kyrgyzstan's autonomy, uh, which has historical roots, um, especially because of the shared border, but fueled by you know, recent events and media coverage in which um, you know, the Chinese, uh, you know, stories of the Chinese government gaining assets in foreign countries, or um, you know, the, this uh, debt trap nar narrative that um, might often come up in, in uh, debates around uh, Chinese investments. Um, and this concern is quite high in Kyrgyzstan because of the, the huge uh, portion of debt owed to China uh, in the country. Um, so there are you know, various plans on how to repay this and some are, and so it often comes up uh, in discussions as well. Um, and yeah, in terms of you know, governance styles, I think um, it, for China, one of the main concerns in Kyrgyzstan is stability, both because it's a country on its border um, and also because it wants to make sure its investments are, are safe. Um, and so as a result of this, there have been a lot of, you know, a, the use of private security contractors uh, in Kyrgyzstan, which can contribute to feelings of uh, tension or uh, militarization in some of the, the sites, um, the investment sites. Um, but apart from this, uh, I don't think at, at the moment there's uh, too much, um, you know, efforts to meddle in kind of internal politics, um, apart from in promoting these interests around uh, stability and trying to, um, yeah, safeguard its investments. Um, I guess one thing to mention, uh, probably running out of time, uh, is that uh, um, Chinese government will be concerned about, uh, you know, countries following some of its key policies on issues like Taiwan and uh, Xinjiang. And so um, this kind of factors in as well. Um, this is, you know, largely a acceptable arrangement for both governments, but I think is another point of contention between the citizens and its government and, and their government, um, you know, where popular, there's quite a lot of popular opposition to policies in Western China, especially, um, whereas the government is largely um, not taking this up because of the economic imbalances uh, between China and Kyrgyzstan. Um, so I think I will, um, stop there, but just to say that um, in the paper we go into quite a bit, uh, you know, um, what we think are some of the, the positive uh, or some of the ways that civil society can engage and, um, you know, advocate for more open kind of um, business dealings and consultations with communities and the role that uh, civil society could play in, um, you know, assisting Chinese companies in some cases or local government officials to kind of take into account some of those locally specific uh, dynamics in uh, for various investments. Um, and much. we're moving on to Dimitri, uh, who's talking about the sort of institutional frameworks in the host countries where Belt and Road initiatives are active. Dimitri, you have the floor. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you can see my uh, presentation. So um, I'm a research assistant at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. And I would like to talk about the determinants of Chinese output foreign direct investment in the Belt and Road Initiative countries with a particular focus on the institutional environment. So I would say it is a reverse uh, question to what Marquette has presented. So whether countries are attracted, whether Chinese investors are attracted by good institutions in the host countries. A couple of words on the organization I'm presenting. YASA is an international organization. You can see the YASA castle in my uh, background. 
It is an independent, interdisciplinary, policy-oriented um, research platform which um, uh, focuses on the science-based uh, policy dialogue and science diplomacy. And it has also very good cooperation with the OEC, contributing, for example, to the Ministerial Council, to the preparatory meetings of the Council, and also organizing and co-organizing side events. So um, Chinese outward foreign direct investment, um, if you look at them historically, up to the end of the uh, 70s, there was almost no FDI coming out of China. For example, in 1979, there was about $500,000 um, coming from China to all over the world. And now, so we have about 100 billion uh, US dollars a year of outward flows. And in 2016, we had a peak with more than 200 billion um, US dollars flowing out of China a year. So if we compare it to 1979, when the uh, policy of open door was launched about that time, it is an increase of uh, 500,000 times. Um, if you look at the structure, then uh, most of the of, um, Chinese uh, flows go to Asia, and there is uh, some kind of a tax haven bias. We see that in 2019, 66% of OFDI went to Hong Kong, and it is found in the literature that then 30% of this amount goes further to the rest of the world, 40% is round trip back to China, and the rest stays in Hong Kong. Uh, top sectors China is investing into are leasing and business services, again, the tax haven buys, manufacturing, finance, also retail trades. Um, the uh, resource sector, I would say, is rather underrepresented if you look at the direct FDI flows from China to their host countries. As for the Belt and Road Initiative, in 2019, only China invested in more than 11,000 enterprises in 63 Belt and Road Initiative countries, about 19 billion US dollars in flows, and uh, in total, since from the start of the initiative in 2013 to 2019, about 120 billion US dollars uh, flew from China to the Belt and Road Initiative countries. And to underlie, these are only direct flows. So uh, in these statistics, we do not know, for example, how much went to the Belt and Road Initiative countries from Hong Kong or from the British Virgin Islands, or from Singapore, etc. And the question one would ask is uh, what determines this um, FDI flow? So why investors choose one country and not another country? Or why they invest abroad and not domestically in China? And here are some um, uh, factors I'm uh, looking at. Uh, so I use the uh, Markusen model and look at the similarities and dissimilarities between China and the host country and also between different host countries. So uh, the variable of interest for this uh, particular presentation is the institutional distance between um, China and the host countries. So it means whether the institution development in country China is investing into is better or worse or equal to the one in China. And I use worldwide governance indicators to um, uh, approximate this institutional distance. So, and it is, um, it comes from the literature that the, uh, it is considered in the literature that a general policy framework really matters uh, when attracting FDI, uh, which includes such aspects as um, stability, good governance, uh, private property protection, and so on. In the case of a worldwide governance indicators by the World Bank, these are control of corruption, rule of law, regulatory quality, government effectiveness, political stability, and voice and accountability. However, uh, recently it has rather been concluded that these institutional variables are conditional on the home country environment. So it does not mean that all investors are attracted by good institutions and all investors are deterred by bad institutions. So it could be the case that when the voice and accountability is low in China, then Chinese investors are not interested in voice and accountability being high in the host countries. 
uh, one more issue about the governance indicators and about their measurement is that uh, many of them are overlapping and tautological in their definition, but also statistically because they're highly correlated. And it is especially true for the controlled corruption, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and rule of law. And they are often um, approximated by, by some kind of a, a weighted average. And I also uh, use it here and uh, follow uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development who also use, that also uses it to capture the um, level of uh, development of economic institutions. So first, it is, of course, interesting to look at how these indicators um, developed in China and developed in China over time. And we see that some of them um, developed negatively or did not develop at all over the whole period, for example, voice and accountability. And it is also one of the findings that it is not at all, not significant at all and doesn't matter for Chinese investors. And I think it is in line with what we see that it is at a very low level in China. Uh, some have uh, developed quite good, um, as is the case with the uh, government effectiveness in China, and uh, some have changed uh, a little um, also in this uh, period. So briefly on the results, and I have marked green those that are um, significant. So I find that um, trade between China and host country is an important indicator, which means that trade and uh, investments are complements uh, for the uh, Chinese investors. Uh, China prefers countries with similar market characteristics. It prefers markets that are growing faster than the Chinese markets. It prefers countries with a low corporate tax rate. The interesting was, finding was that the Belt and Road Initiative itself had a highly significant impact. So China really increased its investments into the Belt and Road Initiative countries after the introduction of the initiative. These governance indicators are found to be negative and not significant. So it means that this institutional environment does not matter for Chinese investors, or if it does, then negatively, but not positively. But what is interesting, and I think it is in line with uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the um, aspects of the uh, keynote and also the workshop that political stability is uh, very important uh, for the Chinese investors. I would say in my analysis, it was uh, one of the most uh, important uh, determinants of uh, Chinese um, uh, foreign uh, direct investments in these uh, countries. So uh, which aspect does it include? Uh, so here are a couple of examples. So uh, different conflicts, external, internal, the stability of the government, whether there is a civil war in the country, level of terrorism and uh, many other different uh, aspects. And uh, this finding is actually in line uh, with also other results. For example, here we can see um, a political risk survey from 2013, uh, which finds that political risk is uh, one of the most important concerns for investors when choosing uh, developing economies. And also the World Bank report ranks political stability number one, concern number one determinant when investing um, abroad. And uh, the next question will be uh, what could one use this data for? And uh, based on this data, one could select variables that could be changed politically and give policy recommendations. So uh, for each country, we can define a so-called uh, foreign direct investment gap. So each country has a potential that uh, it uh, could, um, a potential that uh, it could attract and the FDI that it really attracts. And here the potential is based on the best practice among this BRI sample and best practice is defined here as the average BRI country. And then, we could give such a recommendation for each of the country. For example, number one here in, on the list is Afghanistan. And um, this number implies that if Afghanistan would reach the average level of political stability among the Belt and Road Initiative countries, it could attract 97% more of the Chinese foreign direct investment. 
or, or here, for example, Armenia, if Armenia would reach the average political stability level in the Belt and Road Initiative sample, it could attract 6.5% more um, uh, FDI uh, from China. Uh, and another thing that can be influenced uh, politically and also in the short term is the um, corporate tax rates. So uh, if a country would uh, reduce uh, their, uh, its uh, corporate tax rate uh, to the average corporate tax rate in the sample, it could also attract more uh, Chinese FDI. So again, for example, here in the case of Bangladesh, Bangladesh uh, um, uh, for, uh, tends to have a high uh, corporate tax rate. So it means if Bangladesh would reduce its corporate tax rate to the average corporate tax rate in the Belt and Road Initiative sample, then it could attract 26.5% more FDI from China. Um, so uh, to conclude, it is found that this broad institutional environment consisting of control of corruption, rule of law, regulatory quality, and government effectiveness uh, matters negatively, but insignificantly for Chinese investors. So uh, we could say that uh, for them, it is not that important. The, the level of institutional development of the host country is not important. However, what really matters is the level of political stability. So whether there are internal, external conflicts, and um, based on that, uh, we could uh, give these uh, policy recommendations on how to improve uh, the investment uh, policies, how to attract more foreign direct investments. And uh, here it is important to understand that uh, these uh, policies also have many other positive spillover and multiplier effects. For example, of course, the increase of political stability would not only in attract more FDI, but it would also have uh, many other positive effects on the economy and society of the, of the uh, host country. And in this regard, the next step could be uh, to calculate uh, costs uh, which are necessary to implement uh, such a policy measure. For example, in the case of a corporate tax rate, I think it would be easier than in the case of the political stability, then to uh, calculate all the potential benefits and to make some uh, uh, to make a um, uh, cost uh, benefit uh, calculation to decide which uh, policy measures uh, uh, actually to introduce. Thank you. So without further ado, I would like to come to the introduction of our uh, keynote speaker for today, Professor Heike Holbich, who joins us from Frankfurt in Germany, I guess. So she is a professor of political science with a focus on Chinese and East Asian area studies at Goethe University based in Frankfurt and Germany. Um, and uh, at her chair, and she personally does research on contemporary China and uh, contemporary social and political transformations in China with a particular focus on comparative authoritarianism, regime transitions, uh, and also the evolution and diffusion of norms the influence of discourses and framing processes on the behavior of political and social actors. And so her talk today is also going to focus on, I think, a bit more conceptual questions of um, what are the official visions of democracy, of democracy in Xi Jinping's China. And I'm very curious and looking forward to hearing your talk, Professor Heike Holbich. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for having me, particularly to Brigitte and to Anja for organizing and, and uh, coming up with this idea of a topic of such timely relevance, and also to the OSCE Academy for hosting this event. I'm very happy to share my thoughts about official visions of democracy in China something that I guess most of you might think is a phantom. Um, therefore, I'd first like to clarify that while I have been invited to talk about this topic, and I'm really a sinologist expert on China, but not on Central Asia. So this is really about the Chinese case. Um, the objective of my talk is not to normatively evaluate Chinese democracy or even to euphemize official attempts of political self-legitimation. Rather, 
What I would like to do is to contribute to a context sensitive understanding of the self, self perceptions and worldviews of China as a major global power and an increasingly important actor in Eurasia, in the region that this workshop is focusing on. To put it differently, this is a keynote lecture and the key I have chosen for this is not D major, democracy with a capital letter that would be as we usually apply when we discuss democracy in Western countries or when we deplore the backsliding of democracy in hybrid regimes across the globe. Rather, I will choose D minor as keynote for my talk, democracy with a lowercase d, as a notion that is out there for experimentation, adaptation, localization, if you want, and very often reinterpretation by all kinds of actors and with all kinds of different motivations. So when I quote or paraphrase Chinese discourses about democracy, and I will do so quite a lot in the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes, this is not to spread the word, but to give you a better sense of the internal logics of justification, as well as of the changing tonalities in party discourse, communist party discourse. In the framework of this workshop um, on the impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative on Eurasia, I think this is helpful from an empirical point of view. Despite the frowning and skepticism that some of you might feel uh, when listening to China's democratic self-adulations. So my talk uh, will proceed in three steps. First, I will set the scene by reminding you of some Western, particularly US perceptions of China's political system. Then, and this is the main part of my talk, I will delve into the official self-image of the Chinese democracy as it is propagated by the party state. Briefly um, highlight some of the understandings under Hu Jintao that was the predecessor of Xi Jinping and then in more detail under the leadership of Xi Jinping who succeeded as China's party state um, leader in late 2012. I will use five examples then to illustrate changes under his leadership. And of course, last but not least, I will offer some reflections about why I think it is important to understand Chinese visions of democracy and potential uh, implications they might have in the international realm. Can you hear me clearly? Is my voice uh, clear? I will do without a PowerPoint because I often feel that the PowerPoint somehow stands as a wall between the speaker and the audience. I hope that my voice um, is clear uh, so that you can follow uh, just uh, acoustically. So, first of all, let me remind you that Western political science is unequivocal about China's political system being a textbook example of autocracy. This is true for democracy indices that we uh, conventionally use, such as Polity 4, Freedom in the World, the Democracy Index of the Economist Intelligence Unit, or the Varieties of Democracy Index. All of them have consistently ranked post Mao China as autocracy, not free, authoritarian regime, or closed autocracy, respectively. In 2016, Francis Fukuyama, the prominent author of the 1989 essay, The End of History, pondered that, quote, China is a real test case. It is the only alternative to a liberal capitalist democracy. The country is technically and economically advanced, but it pursues modernization without democracy. So that was 2016. From the perspective of political practitioners in the West, China is not only an autocracy, but one that increasingly and proactively challenges liberal democracies. Back in 2007, 
a German member of parliament described China's combination of a modern authoritarian political system with a capitalist economic system as one of the biggest strategic challenges for Europe. And 12 years later, that was in March 2019, just two years ago, the European Union labeled China a systemic rival, promoting alternative models of governance in uh, her watershed strategic outlook on EU-China relations. That was March 12th, yesterday, two years ago. In the United States, shortly before last year's elections, Robert O'Brien, who was Trump's national security advisor, argued in a foreign affairs article for decades. Conventional wisdom in the United States held that it was only a matter of time before China would become more liberal, first economically and then politically. We could not have been more wrong. A miscalculation that stands as the greatest failure of US foreign policy since the 1930s. Today, that's still O'Brien, the CCP's ideological agenda extends far beyond the country's borders and represents a threat to the idea of democracy itself. And in the same magazine, as part of his own electoral campaign, Joseph Biden called China a special challenge. China is playing the long game, he said, by extending its global reach and promoting its own political model. To meet that challenge, he called for a united front of US allies and partners. And he envisaged to hold a summit for democracy, to renew the spirit and shared purpose of the nations of the free world. As we can see from these quotes and many others could be added, China is not merely seen as one non-democratic regime among others, rather, it has increasingly been pitted against the liberal democracies of the West and as the number one challenge to the idea of democracy itself. These signals of othering China, of setting China against the liberal uh, democracies of the West, um, have not gone unheard in Beijing and the party state leadership has not been shy to take up the challenge in one way or another. As I would like to show in the following, China's socialist system has been framed as a democracy for a while already. Since Xi Jinping stepped to power, however, party propaganda has made increasing efforts to stylize China as the world's largest democracy and as a more genuine and more effective form of democracy than the liberal democracies of the West. The term democracy in Chinese, that is minzhu, people rule, okay, um, has never been considered an alien concept since the founding of the Chinese Communist Party a century ago in July uh, 1921. As part of the, let's say, vocabulary of Europe's long 19th century of enlightenment, the term democracy had been adapted into the Chinese language via Japanese around the turn of the 19th century. In a social Darwinist worldview that was prevalent then, um, it denoted, democracy denoted the quintessential modern, civilized and sovereign nation state with all the prerequisites to prevail as a nation in the survival of the fittest. Democracy in such a social Darwinist sense also had a positive connotation in Mao Zedong's historical treatises on new democracy uh, in the 1940s that was the time of the civil war with the Guomindang, as the formula to co-opt social elites who fought for national emancipation alongside the Chinese Communist Party. When the People's Republic of China, it's already in the name, right? 
when the People's Republic of China was founded in October 1949, it was based on the Leninist principle of democratic centralism. Democratic centralism. According to this principle, leaders are formally elected and key policies collectively discussed, but the political decisions reached by these voting processes are binding upon all members of the party and as the vanguard of the revolution, the party leadership has always the final say. The country's first constitution of 1940, uh, sorry, 1954, 1954, modeled on the Soviet Union, established the National People's Congress as the embodiment of popular sovereignty under the leadership of the CCP. You might just have seen the plenary session of the end of this National People's Congress on TV. It's this huge room with 3000 delegates who usually uh, say yes to what they are presenting. That's the popular sovereignty under the leadership of the party. And the most recent constitution of 1982, which reacted to the Maoist excesses of the Cultural Revolution, reconfirmed the principle of democratic centralism and the formal status of the NPC as the highest organ of state power. This is how the constitution puts it. Now, the ideas of Chinese democracy in the reform era under Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao and so on, have been spelled out most authoritatively in a white paper published in Chinese and English also for international audiences in 2005. This document defines the main features of socialist political democracy. For example, we learn that, quote, China's democracy is a people's democracy under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. Or China's democracy is a democracy in which the overwhelming majority of the people act as masters of state affairs. What appears as pleonasms to Western readers should sound quite familiar for those among you who have been raised in the Soviet era or in the post-Soviet, under the post-Soviet legacy, or who do research on the post-Soviet uh, regimes. The notion of people's democracy is the socialist alternative to Western democracies based on multi-party systems that are regarded to be dominated by bourgeois capitalist elites. The idea that the people act as masters of the state combines the party's legitimacy claim of people's sovereignty with the principle of party leadership, which is regarded as prerequisite to ensure the people's role as masters of the state. As the 2005 white paper elaborates further, China features multiple elements of a democracy, among them the system of people's congresses, which formally elect state leaders, though only among pre-selected candidates, the system of Chinese people's political consultative conferences as symbols of the party's united front, which are constituted of co-opted social and economic elites. Then you might also have heard about, and this is uh, very prominent in the white paper, about experiences with grassroots democracy in villages and urban resident committee elections, which are also manipulated by the party, as well as citizens' economic and political rights and respect of human rights, which has been codified in the constitution in 2004, but interpreted in very local ways. Last but not least, the white paper emphasizes, so the 2005 white paper emphasizes that the party promotes so-called inner party democracy. This includes experiments with inner party elections where party organizations and members can nominate candidates and where the ratio of excess candidates has been raised over time to make these inner party elections more competitive. 
Overall, this white paper of 2005 under Hu Jintao's leadership shows that the Chinese party state has strived to position itself as a full-fledged, high-grade and successful democratic system long before Xi Jinping's succession as the country's paramount leader in November 2012. However, as I would like to show, the claim toward Chinese democracy has been articulated in much more assertive ways under Xi Jinping's leadership. Let me illustrate this um, and the official visions of democracy in Xi Jinping's China with five examples. During uh, the last years of the Hu Wen era, domestic and international voices openly criticized the political stalemate and stagnation, which they blamed on the weak collective leadership style cultivated by Hu Jintao. Many hoped, including American observers, for a new bold vision and authority at the top and for a strongman leadership to get things done. Indeed, this is what they got. In October 2012, a few weeks only before the 18th Party Congress that would baptize Xi as the new Secretary General of the party, Chinese television and YouTube channels disseminated an animated video titled How Leaders Are Made. It went viral among Chinese and foreign audiences. Maybe some of you have seen it. The five minute clip compares how leaders rise to power in the US and in China. The US process featuring a smiling Barack Obama is caricatured as a series of drawn out and costly election campaigns, political string pulling behind the scenes and the overriding importance of the final act of voting. In contrast, the Chinese process is depicted as selecting the president, featuring a smiling Xi Jinping, on the basis of merit and skills. Candidates earn these skills over the course of long political careers in many Chinese provinces, moving up the administrative ladder and facing various acid tests. The clip concludes, I quote, many roads lead to national leadership and every country has one for itself. Whether a single ballot that gets the whole nation out to vote or by meritocratic screening that requires years of hard work like the making of a Kung Fu master, as long as people are satisfied and the country develops and progresses as a result, it's working. That's the last sentence of this five minute clip, how leaders are made. Also, the term democracy is not used in the clip. It invokes central elements thereof, such as public interest and popular consent and effective governance. In this Chinese version of democracy, Merit replaces electoral campaigns. Candidates are screened instead of being elected according to their merits and performance output tops procedural input and accountability. With that, let me turn to my second example. A subtle shift of emphasis in the official discourse of China's democracy with adjectives that could be observed between the lines in the report of the 18th Party Congress in November 2012. The notion of inner party democracy that was promoted under the predecessor, Hu Jintao, um, was now clearly downplayed. Instead, the document stressed the importance of so-called consultative democracy. In Chinese, this is xie shang minzhu, consultative democracy. As I have traced in another article, this concept had been imported and adapted in party theory circles over more than a decade to make a very long 
story of adaptation short, this consultative democracy is a localized version of Jürgen Habermas' notion of deliberative democracy, also translated as Xiechang Minzhu. Habermas had introduced his concept of deliberative democracy to students in Beijing back in 2001. His idea of an open-ended, freewheeling public communication among free and equal citizens who confer and take decisions based on the unforced force of the rational argument has gained much currency among Chinese students and academics at the time. In the course of its official Chinese adaptation, however, Habermas original idea of a horizontally structured deliberation between citizens was reinterpreted step by step as a vertical pattern of consultation organized top down by the party center. Here is a passage from the uh, 18th Party Congress report about socialist consultative democracy. This is described as an, I quote, important form of people's democracy in our country. Extensive consultations should be carried out on major issues relating to economic and social development, as well as specific problems involving the people's immediate interests. To solicit a wide range of opinions, pool wisdom of the people, increase consensus and build up synergy. We should adhere to and improve the system of political consultation under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. So this is this vertical logic. And seven years later, that was just uh, two years ago in another party document, Xi Jinping rephrased this idea even more clearly. He said, the essence of the people's democracy is that people get to discuss their own affairs. Consultative democracy is an important way of effecting party leadership and a model and strengths unique to China's socialist democracy. In a nutshell, in the official notion of consultative democracy, Social elites are consulted in a hierarchical fashion by the party state to forge consensus and thereby to legitimize, uh, to legitimize party rule. And the consultation process is circumscribed by the CCP's organizational and ideological leadership monopoly. In other words, Xi Jinping not only has reduced the extent of inner party competition and collective leadership, which Hu Jintao still had promoted. Rather, Xi Jinping appears also more inclined than his predecessor to keep democratic consultation within proper limits and to open this exercise only to segments of society that the party can control. As my third example shows, democracy not only comes with adjectives, intra-party, consultative and so on democracy, um, but it also comes without adjectives, just as democracy in the Chinese official discourse. Soon after Xi Jinping's succession as party leader, the propaganda apparatus presented a set of 12 so-called socialist core values. According to the relevant text, the socialist core values are the soul of the Chinese nation and they serve as the guide for building socialism with Chinese characteristics. Praised as the common denominator for the values of socialism, the 12 core values are laid out on three different levels. The nation state, society and the individual level, with four values ascribed to each level. At the top, it's prosperity, democracy, they come first, followed by civility and harmony. Prosperity, democracy, civility, harmony. These four values are seen as national objectives 
and as taking guiding roles over all other values. At the medium level of society, the four core values are freedom, equality, justice, and rule of law. And at the personal level, the core values are patriotism, dedication, integrity, and friendliness. It would be nice to reflect about this hierarchical set of values in some detail, but as time is limited, let me focus on democracy only here. In the authoritative text published for the, for the official inauguration of this 12 set of socialist core values campaign, that was in May 2013, democracy was defined like this. Democracy is a beautiful aspiration of human society. The democracy we strive for is a people's democracy and its true core is the people acting as masters of the state. This sounds familiar to what we've heard before from the white paper in 2005, but it goes on. Democracy is the life of socialism and the political guarantee for creating a beautiful and happy life for the people. The Socialist Core Values campaign that continues until today has also been researched in a recent study just in January this year. Based on a collection of almost 400 propaganda posters that have been disseminated online and offline across the country since 2013. You can still see them in, in every street. The study has come to a very interesting finding. While the 12 core values have been replicated as a complete set over time, only six of them have been given detailed illustration in the propaganda posters. These are prosperity, civility and harmony, as national level values and patriotism, friendliness and integrity as personal level values. Democracy, as well as freedom, equality, justice and rule of law and dedication are conspicuously absent from the theme specific posters. As the author analyzes these missing six values, including democracy, have very specific definitions, all of which fall under the strict guideline of the party state, as individuals are not expected to interpret or contribute towards these values, but instead are considered the beneficiaries in a society where these values will be allowed to prosper. Values such as democracy and rule of law are not popularized in the poster collection. One might add that by reproducing the notion of democracy over and over again in a line with the other core values, the propaganda campaign might have a two-pronged effect, a double effect. One is to inculcate the notion of democracy without adjectives in people's minds and everyday language. The other is to inoculate the very notion of democracy, to tame and immunize it against potential challenges who might strive for democracy with a capital letter and who might want to interpret democracy in a more specific way than the official idea of a beautiful aspiration of human society. Based on such a domesticated version of democracy, it might not come as a surprise anymore that Chinese official media have hailed the country as the world's largest democracy. And this is my fourth example. In August 2015, the party controlled uh, Global Times ran this headline, which is ultimately the largest democratic nation? The answer is obvious, but let us see how the argument is built. The article starts with an attack against the West. Above all, the United States, which had tried for a long time to exclude China from the global values discourse for being undemocratic. 
In contrast, India, which in the eyes of the West was the world's largest democracy, is found to enjoy an unjustified high level of trust in the West due to the same normative bias. Against this backdrop, the article then argues that it is time for China to break free from this discourse trap laid out by the West and secure the power of interpretation of global values as well as of the essence of democracy. Democracy is described as a historically formed term that has developed differently in various epochs and regions and for which there are no fixed standards. The Arab Spring and its aftermath are mentioned to show that the Western democratic model is not compatible with non-Western cultural contexts. The lessons to be learned are that without stability and order, neither prosperity for the people nor civilizational progress will be achieved. The article then claims that China represents a particularly genuine and effective form of democracy compared to others. Unlike in many facade democracies across the globe, China ensures that different social strata and ethnic groups are adequately represented in the political process. Unlike in certain states, the Chinese people do not merely have the choice between different political dynasties on election day. Instead, they are involved every day in a number of important decision-making processes through a range of consultative mechanisms. Overall, the article argues, socialism with Chinese characteristics has been proven to represent the true interests of the people and the country's economic success proves the vitality of the democratic system. Thus, China can be considered the largest democratic nation. Last but not least, it is time for China, the article recommends, to make this clear and no longer silently accept its false, undemocratic image. What we find here is a new dimension, I think, in China's official vision of democracy, if not a new habitus of the Chinese leadership. No matter whether these claims appear credible or not, it's the claim to challenge Western democracy itself that counts here. The claim to end Western discourse hegemony, the claim to protect China's own discourse power and contest Western interpretations of global values, as well as the claim that China outperforms its Western counterparts in various regards. As my fifth, and last example, that may illustrate the role of democracy in Xi Jinping's new era. The new era was inaugurated at the 19th Party Congress in late 2017. And it entailed the definition of a new principal contradiction in China society. Those of you who are familiar with historical materialism might remember that, according to Marx, each period of social development is characterized by a specific principal contradiction and its correct identification allows the vanguard party to solve this contradiction and thereby to further the socialist cause. Now, the Mao era had been characterized by the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, which had to be solved by class struggle. In the reform era under Deng Xiaoping, the principal contradiction had been between the ever-growing material and cultural needs of the people versus backward social production. According to Xi Jinping, this contradiction has been solved in the meantime thanks to China's unparalleled economic performance and the improvement of people's the livelihoods over the past four decades. Thus, in the new era, 
the principal contradiction is no longer about quantity, but quality. It is now a contradiction between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing needs for a better life, and this is where democracy comes in. The better life which people demand in Xi's eyes includes democracy, rule of law, fairness, justice, security, and a better environment. Indeed, democracy appears here as the first among various aspirational values that are propagated as expressions of a better life and as an output, among other outputs, that the party promises to provide with a view to satisfy the people. And not only that, by the mid of the 21st century, Xi Jinping envisages to develop China into, I translate literally here, develop China into a rich and strong, democratic, civilized, harmonious and beautiful, modernized, socialist, strong nation. Yes, the term strong is used twice in the Chinese original, which is Xi Jinping's innovative contribution to the party's strategic, party, uh, strategic target for 2049, when the People's Republic of China will celebrate its uh, 100th anniversary. As we can learn from these slogans, democracy is celebrated as part and parcel of the official party state vision for China, not only in the present, but even more so in the future. At the same time, the claim toward a democratic China is bracketed, if I may say so, by the claim toward becoming a strong nation and a great power by the mid of the century. What we might conceive here is the re-emergence of a vocabulary that used to be characteristic of a social Darwinist worldview of the late 19th century, of a struggle between nations where being democratic appears as an advantage in the survival of the fittest in the international realm. Now to conclude, I would like to offer some reflections about what the Chinese visions of democracy might imply for the country's interactions with the region that is in the focus of this workshop. First, I hope you agree that it is helpful to take into account the self views and world views of actors in different regions, which are becoming increasingly important in the context of changing international power constellations and specifically to better assess Chinese expectations, ideological positions, strategic portfolios and preferences vis-a-vis -vis other countries and actors. China's official visions of democracy, and this is my second conclusion, can be seen as an almost ironic response to the widespread perceptions that China challenges not only Western liberal democracies, but the idea of democracy itself. In a nutshell, we can conclude from the examples that I've given that the Chinese version of democracy is one not of the people and not one by the people, but a democracy for the people under the leadership of the Communist Party, and it comes without all the hassles of electoral campaigns, of protesting, of democratic rights and accountability. Whether these visions of Chinese democracy are plausible and credible or not, appears less important than the contestation of what is perceived as long-standing discourse hegemony of the West. China's alternative discourse on democracy might gain traction in times of newly emerging geopolitical alliances, and the Belt and Road Initiative might be a platform for that. Together with its economic clout, China's rejection of the perceived discourse, discourse hegemony 
could make a growing impression on actors in Eurasia and other world regions who could have increasing reason to accept China as an alternative international rule maker and possibly also as a leader in the democratization of international relations. Third and last, much will depend also upon the self-image of Western democracies. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the varying effectiveness of public health responses in countries worldwide has shaken, if not severely damaged, the self-confidence of liberal democracy in its superior capacity to deliver the public goods. It is hard to tell whether China's robust and effective response to the pandemic at home and its vaccine diplomacy abroad will lend more credence to its official visions of democracy. Probably not as such. However, I think that the malaise of Western liberal democracies that has only deepened in the wake of the pandemic tends to benefit China's claims to contest the perceived discourse hegemony of the West and to project its own interpretations of global values such as democracy and other beautiful aspirations of human society. Thank you. I'm happy to get your comments and questions um, after I see a quite long talk. I hope we still have some opportunity to discuss and I will also stay with you during uh, this day's conference. Then we have Els Vieta. Pron, assistant professor at the University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland. Uh, I'm very happy that we started from actually a strategy of China towards Central Asia, because in my speech, I will talk about the other direction. Um, uh, that is how Central Asia in general, and in Kazakhstan in particular, deals with um, China's activities just across uh, the border in Xinjiang. Um, I will talk about an issue that has become a problem to tackle by Kazakhstan authorities about four years ago, that is China security and ethnic policies in Xinjiang. Um, I will try to see or I will address how this issue resonates in Kazakhstan society and how it is addressed uh, by the authorities. And in my conclusions, I will also relate this topic to the main theme of this workshop that is uh, its influence, that is influence on democracy in um, Kazakhstan. So um, let me start from the background. Um, China's uh, security strategy in Xinjiang. Uh, it started around two, 2014, the, the latest one, let's say, uh, dubbed strike hard against violent terrorism. And initially it was seen as a kind of continuation of Beijing earlier strategies in Xinjiang uh, to, um, to ensure stability of the region and um, security of the region. And it was the, the previous ones were very much um, targeted at Uyghurs. Um, but um, according to different estimates, uh, nowadays we can talk about at least 2 million people who are uh, forcibly uh, detained in so-called re-education facilities in Xinjiang. They are held for prolonged period of time and um, other, um, other Xinjiang dwellers are also um, subject of several restrictions to everyday life, um, including um, uh, including bus surveillance, digital system, uh, religio um, religious and cultural practices, which are severely restricted, as well as there are many other human rights violations, as well as a right to privacy at uh, households is violated in many ways. And we have already seen a very long-term social, cultural and demographic impact on the region with um, sharp decrease in birth rate um, with um, uh, many uh, um, disturbances to the cultural continuity of uh, Xinjiang Muslims, as well as um, a very uh, brutal disruption of uh, family, family links by putting adults in re-education uh, facilities and uh, putting children in state-run orphanages and other state institutions. 
Uh, what also makes this campaign different from the earlier Beijing campaigns in Xinjiang um, is actually is actually it's uh, very much total reach of the campaign and the fact that the second largest minority uh, when it comes to those who are detained in Xinjiang are actually Kazakh people. Uh, this is something that has not been had not been seen before to 2014 uh, with earlier campaigns. Um, when it comes to the numbers, uh, we estimate that there is at least uh, about 170,000 Kazakh people who are forcibly detained in Xinjiang. Uh, some sources related to human rights um, activists and organizations say about half a million Kazakh people, which is uh, which makes a third of the whole Kazakh minority in China. Uh, some of these detainees are full nationals of Kazakhstan. Uh, some of them, for some of them, the status of just status is unclear. Uh, most of them are said uh, to have um, incorrectly given up Chinese citizenships, and therefore, if they stay in Xinjiang, they are subject to Chinese law, and this is the basis on which they are um, uh, detained in in these facilities. So. It actually caused a uh, main dilemma for Kazakhstan. The dilemma uh, is how to maintain a coherent, multivectoral Eurasian for an econ economic policy, which main directions are Russia, Europe and China, and at the same time continue this kind of a nation building rhetoric, which uh, has been developed in the early 1990s. And this rhetoric uh, has been clear in Kazakhstan policies of repopulating the country with ethnic Kazakhs from abroad, but also with providing a very thorough moral, financial and cultural support for um, all Kazakh communities worldwide, the largest of which, by the way, is located in, in China. Uh, what makes this dilemma of Kazakhstan authorities even more complex is actually the publicity on Xinjiang Kazakhs. So there are four main factors that make this problem uh, visible, uh, that uh, makes this problem important. And the first are whistleblowers and refugees. Um, I put in brackets the name of the most famous one, Sairagul Southby. Um, who escaped uh, China in, to, to, in around spring 2018. Um, she was uh, forcibly held in one of Xinjiang detention uh, facilities. She, was, uh, she worked as a uh, Mandarin instructor there. I mean, she was forced to work, of course. And uh, she provided an extremely thorough uh, testimony of the whole system of the ill treatment, torture and other human rights violations that uh, Xinjiang Muslims are um, experiencing in, in, in these facilities. But also we have uh, very prominent human rights uh, lawyers uh, in Kazakhstan, such as uh, Ayman Umarova, uh, also a winner of the, one of the US awards for women of, for, uh, women of courage, as well as a prominent and very charismatic human rights activist, uh, Serigjan Dilash, uh, also from Kazakhstan. I think now he's based in the US or still in Turkey. And the second thing is local and in international human rights associations. Uh, I enlisted four or five of them. Uh, the, the first and the most well known is Atajut, or um, now it goes uh, under another name, Atajut Rik uh, Tileri. Then we have Kaharman Human Rights Initiative, Demos, and Kazakhstan Bureau for Human Rights. Uh, these four are based in Kazakhstan, um, and so the, the last one, Free Kazakhs, are, is the US based human rights organization. Um, it, from what I have seen for past two years, there is not so much cooperation between these human rights organizations, but the, for all of them, issue of Xinjiang is an important one, uh, is the one that they regularly raise, uh, the one on which they organize individual press conferences, uh, protests, uh, all kinds of demonstrations and things like this. So it's still, I mean, the, the issue is still on, although we, I couldn't see much of, an, of a cooperation between these um, um, individual organizations. Um, they also publish a lot about Xinjiang. Uh, they send a lot of um, um, different kind of motions to international institutions. 
uh, they are very active in social media and what is really important they are also very active in English language which makes uh, issue even more visible out of uh, Kazakhstan and out of Central Asia. Uh, apart from this, we have had uh, uh, mass scale protests regarding issue of Xinjiang demonstrations, as well as more recently due to COVID pandemics, uh, solo protesters usually um, demanding uh, release of the relatives in front of uh, Chinese embassies and Chinese consulates in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And there is also uh, one more factor on the, uh, on the next uh, uh, page. It's actually international recognition of the issue. There is a growing number of international institutions, international organizations and individual governments uh, which uh, openly state their criticism or openly um, say their criticism about China's policies in Xinjiang. And what is very important, they more and more emphasize um, Kazakh victims. It's not only about a group of um, Xinjiang Muslims or Uyghurs, there are also uh, Kazakhs are now enumerated as, the, as, as the victims. Um, uh, here I focus on two main actors, both very important for uh, Kazakhstan foreign economic policy. The first is the EU, the second one is the USA. Um, the EU has issued almost on a yearly basis uh, resolutions on, um, on, on Xinjiang and in all of them, um, they're, they're, I mean, in the text of revolutions, resolutions, we can see, um, um, thank you, we can see uh, that the Kazakhs, uh, Kazakh people, Kazakh victims are among the, the, those who are enumerated. With, when it comes to the USA, here the response will came a bit later because it was actually only a year ago, but it was um, much more visible internationally. It was not resolutions, not the official documents. It was actually uh, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo who stand shoulder to shoulder with families of, of, uh, of victims, uh, of families of victims of Xinjiang policies. And um, he has been extremely open about this issue, naming it um, with a very bold political words and advocating uh, um, the end of these practices by China. So um, he's been also very active uh, on his Twitter, although he now stepped down from the office. So when we look at Kazakhstan official responses um, to this, we can um, divide it into three main phases. The first one was kind of a rejection or ignorance of the issue from 2017 to beginning of 2018 when authorities uh, tried to avoid raising the issue officially by any means possible. The second one uh, was more, the most proactive. Uh, it was like the, the, the last period of Nazarbayev. It was a careful, tacit diplomatic steps when actually uh, there was some kind of diplomatic, um, diplomatic uh, talks going on on the issue and Kazakhstan authorities officially announced that they managed to allow over 2,000 Kazakh uh, ethnic Kazakhs leave China and come to Kazakhstan. And the third one is now under Tokayev. Uh, we ex I mean, it was expected that there will be a positive change as Tokayev embarked on a very proactive, uh, proactive, uh, pro proactive domestic policy when it comes to social issues. Um, he established Supreme Council for Reforms. He also uh, established National Council for Public Confidence when he invited a lot of human rights activists and human rights lawyers to actually address the most pressing issues for Kazakh society. Unfortunately, as underlined by many human rights activists, we can't see many, I mean, any, any, any step forward when it comes to actually um, addressing Xinjiang issue. What, what we could see is that actually Tokayev tries to address the public grievances, but also try to seal the borders so that there will be no more Kazakhs escaping China and seeking the seeking political asylum in Kazakhstan. So um, it, these are my concluding remarks. Uh, we can see a kind of a change in approach over these four years, but not a change in attitude. Um, there is also what is positive in, when it comes to democracy, we can see kind of unchanging activeness and human rights awareness of grassroots movements. I mean, the issue is still on and despite the pandemics, you can see, you can still hear about it, read about it. And uh, this grad, grassroots movements, local, also local grassroots movements in Kazakhstan, they still remain very much active about it. But we can't really see much of a positive effect on democracy in Kazakhstan, despite the pressure from the West liberal democracies. 
And Kazakhstan policies towards China when it comes to Xinjiang strategy still seems to be guided by um, this much praised multi sectoral economic and foreign policy, an integral part of which um, is China. And if you want to um, get some more bibliography on this and uh, some more detailed um, um, details, uh, there are already there have been already two publications on this issue co-authored by me, and um, the third one hopefully will be some sometime around summer. Let's so move to the next presentation. Uh, Nurzad Niyazbekov on Chinese foreign aid and autocratization of Central Asia. Hello everyone, thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, I hope you can uh, guys hear me. Uh, my name is Eran Nursit. Uh, I am from Almaty, where I'm currently actually based, and I work as an assistant professor in the department of IR, Kimat University. So, uh, to begin with, I'd like to say a quick caveat that this is a work in progress. Um, and I'm really glad that we have uh, representatives from uh, all of the Central Asian countries here, so fully, uh, with the exception of maybe Turkmenistan. But anyways, I'm saying that because I'd like to uh, hear some feedback, maybe some concrete uh, cases of a recent protest or a recent development uh, in, in the story, which I'm going to tell you now. So uh, uh, this paper is, uh, is a continuation of a work I have produced uh, roughly a year ago calling it uh, the potential democratizing effects of anti-Chinese sentiments in Central Asia. And uh, since then, unfortunately, neither me nor you guys have seen any positive developments. Uh, I'm talking about uh, democratization as such. Quite the opposite, we have been witnessing uh, very negative signals uh, coming from, the where, from where exactly Central Asia is headed. I'm uh, referring to the outbreak of the pandemic, I'm talking about the Chinese humanitarian aid, consultancies, public diplomacy provided to Central Asian countries, and in general, the global demise of, of democracy and, and so on and so forth. Right, so um, the question which um, we're all, uh, we have been discussing for already two days is does growing Chinese aid uh, lead to Central Asia, uh, to Central Asia and make it more autocratic? So I'm not asking the question of how, but I'm actually trying to um, um, contribute to the existing debates in the literature on autocracy promotion in regards to what uh, the big uh, donors are doing in regards to promoting democracy or autocracy. So China is the actor which we will be, uh, which I am looking at. So method originally I wanted to uh, do some regression analysis similar to those uh, that we watched yesterday, but um, there are lots of problems there in terms of conceptualization and then operationalization, lots of gaps in, uh, in data on uh, Chinese aid, lots of debates on that and this. So I decided to go the, um, uh, the case study approach. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm nonetheless uh, using the, uh, the official data published by various sources here, international organizations, financial structures, like the World Bank and such. But um, for my um, dependent variable, obviously, I'm looking at uh, democracy scores. So uh, this is the reason why I decided to uh, rely on the varieties of democracy, democracy index. Um, data on foreign aid, uh, I pulled it from the aid data. Uh, Freedom House, again, uh, talks about the dependent variable. And uh, the AI global surveillance index, you will see why I'm, I'm going to use it. Uh, I'm using this because it's going um, to talk to, um, to, to Dr. Berger's argument he raised earlier today. So this is essentially the method. I will introduce the argument in the end. Let me just uh, bring up uh, the, the, the puzzle, the story here. So this is um, two graphs I pulled from the eight uh, data website. So this first figure here is illustrating the volume and composition of China's public diplomacy. So I decided to look at the recently, relatively recently published uh, report on public diplomacy because it has financial diplomacy concept um, measured there, which consists of Chinese official finance for infrastructure, budget support, debt relief, and humanitarian aid. So all of these um, components here 
uh, represent the foreign aid, okay? Not investments, I'm not looking at FDIs, I'm only looking at subsidized loans, uh, humanitarian aid, some gifts and grants, okay? So that is what I see as uh, foreign aid. So Kazakhstan, as you all know, uh, has been in receipt of the largest amounts of uh, Chinese aid. So, uh, um, and uh, this figure is illustrate the aid that's been there since uh, 2002 until 2007. So uh, Kazakhstan is followed by India. So this graph is talking about Central and South Asia. So we need to pull out specifically Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, which is the third, third largest recipient of Chinese aid. And then there is Uzbekistan over here with 13.2 uh, billion US dollars. Tajikistan, um, so yeah, Turkmenistan uh, receiving the, the smallest amount of, of aid from China. And the second uh, figure here is showing the China's financial diplomacy, specifically uh, Chinese aid, okay? So these things which are, which you can see in this box here. Okay, so proportionally speaking, Kazakhstan is, has received 32 billion US dollars okay, in 2017. So this is a lot of money. This is followed by um, Turkmenistan because of uh, the uh, natural gas resources. And then, then there is Kyrgyzstan, most of, uh, of the investments, most of the aid um, uh, targeting the Confucius Institutes, the cultural programs and the public diplomacy per se. And then there is Uzbekistan and then Tajikistan receiving the smallest amount of aid. So the, the puzzle, uh, the, the literature on Chinese autocracy promotion is, uh, has says some very quiet evidence. Some of this literature is saying that uh, China is, Chinese aid is uh, causing a detrimental effect on the country's democracy uh, scores. But there is another evidence uh, coming from other authors which is saying, no, it is not necessarily making these countries more authoritarian. So I decided to go and look at um, this data myself. So here in front of you is just the democracy scores for, uh, for Central Asia. Okay, I'm not uh, comparing this, I'm not uh, running this against uh, the foreign aid indicators, just you know, the, the rough numbers since 2013 and until uh, last year. We can see that there has been no apparent change in the civil liberties. So civil liberties index produced by the varieties of democracy is, uh, is more or less the same. Okay, so uh, we cannot really discern, identify a major discrepancy in how things might have changed as a result of a growing Chinese engagement in the region, okay? Uh, next, if we look at the measure of, of accountability, which is another classical indicator of democracy, still no major change. So the, the question in the survey looked as, to what extent is the ideal of government accountability achieved? There are some other variations of this horizontal accountability, vertical accountability. So I decided to, do, to look at this one and still no apparent change. So does it mean that Central Asian uh, Chinese engagement has not uh, made the region more authoritarian? Could be, could be. Let's keep this question in mind. Talking about the elections, so nothing has changed in the way that the elections are held. Um, so elections have not become uh, more or less restrictive, more or less egalitarian, more or less open. So still no change there, okay? But surprisingly, um, speaking of the regime corruption, uh, if we talk about how effective were Central Asian governments in combating corruption, we are seeing very slight improvements starting from 2016. But I wouldn't uh, rush and associate this anyhow with, uh, uh, with the Chinese aid. Okay, there could be some other factors. So, uh, okay, it's just a positive dynamic here, which I would not, you know, uh, tie strictly to Chinese aid. So let's talk about some uh, major findings here. As uh, we have already seen, there is no significant change across key democracy variables. So Central Asia remains to be authoritarian, equally authoritarian as it used to be five or so years ago. So um, there is no concrete evidence that Chinese aid is causing the region to be more 
authoritarian. However, there are some changes which we can see, you know, without even referring to any democracy scores. This is what we can observe from the field, talking to the activists, observing, uh, watching some news and developments uh, in regards to protests, anti-Chinese protests. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so protection of privacy has uh, deteriorated. Political and physical violence has escalated. Government's internet shutdown capacity has increased. This could be COVID, this could be um, some other issues there. Heightened state surveillance, this is the authoritarian tech surveillance cameras, face recognition, rise of anti-Chinese protests in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. This is uh, taken from the Central Asian Protest Tracker, which uh, is uh, an empirical evidence for that. So above changes reflect growing anti-Chinese sentiments, despite the growing Chinese public di diplomacy efforts. The second slide I showed you in the beginning. Um, let's skip this one. Right, uh, China is not promoting autocracy in Central Asia per se, but unconditionality of its eight tenths autocrats to abuse office and seek grants to legitimize and strengthen their rules through the following effects. So the above leads not to autocratic stabilization, but rather authoritarian deepening. So China is creating subtle conditions, subtle favorable conditions for authoritarian deepening. Alignment of Chinese and Central Asian notions of democracy. In Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev has been talking of the Kazakh way, Kazakh vision of democracy. So China has given the Kazakhstan this opportunity and not only Kazakhstan, but to other Central Asian countries in light of also the global crisis of liberal democracy, right-wing extremism, populism. So all of that, uh, including Putin himself, have all discredited democracy and uh, China has become the, the new role model. So it's like a marriage of convenience between Central Asia and China. So uh, the argument which I uh, advanced in the paper, which I published a year ago, stands still there. Anti-Chinese protests are driven by ethnic cleansing in Xinjiang, influx of Chinese labor migrants can technically pave a way uh, for a popular mobilization to challenge the weaker Central Asian governments. Uh, I don't see any weaker Central Asian governments anymore, thanks to the, and thanks to these factors here, because China has helped the existing weak Central Asian governments to further consolidate and deepen their regimes. So the window of opportunity, which could have been there a year or two ago, is no longer there, and now it's become even more difficult for any civic right, civil civil rights activists. To pull, to pull out, uh, to pull up any, to take off any uh, democratic initiatives. So let's move on to the fourth paper in this panel, uh, Artem Dankov, who will talk about China's Belt and Road Initiative and sustainable urban development in Central Asia. Uh, I, I will try to to, to explain how uh, China uh, influences uh, the sustainable urban development in Central Asia and how it can uh, make challenges for democratization in, in the region. Uh, I have three, I, 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 as I have already said, uh, I will, um, uh, I want to be laconic. I want to, uh, to uh, first of all, therefore I, I want to, to present my main arguments, that there are three main arguments First of all, uh, I think that sustainable urban development in Central Asia is the most important element for the um, process of democratization in region, for the future of the dem democracy in, in region. Uh, the second argument is that uh, China's Belt and Road aid or investments uh, does not have positive effect on sustainable urban development in Central Asian countries. And the third uh, argument is uh, that this um, um, negative effect uh, is not a result of uh, grand strategy or secret plan. I, I'm not a supporter of conspiracy theory. I think it's a, it is a result of misunderstanding of Chinese side, Chinese government, um, uh, re situation in, in region, in some, in some countries, 
in Central Asian societies. Uh, and sometimes it, it is a result of uh, uh, different uh, understanding of uh, what do we need to support, for example. Therefore, uh, some, there are a lot of uh, examples when uh, uh, projects uh, which are supported by, which were supported by Chinese governments, <coughs> government uh, uh, did not help, or sometimes they have a negative effect on uh, sustainable social social development. Uh, we live in a in a rapid just a second. We live in a rapidly urbanizing world uh, where city populations are growing in across the globe uh, at an impressive rate. This trend uh, is also apparent for the Central Asia. According to the forecasts, uh, after maybe 30 years, we will see uh, more than uh, 40, uh, 45 million uh, people residing in cities in the region. And the problem is that the fastest, uh, fastest, <coughs> fastest increase take place, takes place in the major cities in Central Asia, which are gradually becoming into mega cities. And this gives rise to a range of political challenges for Central Asian states. Um, urbanization processes in Central Asia uh, are extremely unbalanced. Uh, we can see some areas boasting lots of city residents and other regions, areas still dominated by rural communities. Uh, but according to official data in uh, Last year, the region's seven largest cities boasted over 9 million residents, inhabitants, or more than 12% uh, of the total population. Uh, over the past years, these cities' population have increased by at least twofold, uh, with uh, Astana or Nur Sultan being the absolute leader, as the number of its inhabitants has tripled. Here you can see uh the, the the data uh you 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 can see how how the, the population has changed and it led to the problems uh to some problems uh central asia's major city cities will continue to expand uh, in the future in medium term uh, by 2030, cities that today have population of over 9 million are expected to be uh, more than 12 million uh, and almost 25 million uh, combined with the settlements around the, the new uh, mega cities, the, the, the major cities. Uh, in fact, in 10 years, uh, time every third Central Asian resident will live in a large agglomerations uh, around the million plus cities like Nur Sultan, Almaty, Tashkent, etc. And um, what are the, 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 the main political challenges and what about the influence uh, of Chinese help uh, or Chinese uh, 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 Belt and Road Initiative on, on the Sustainable Urban Development. Uh, there, there, are, there are some political challenges. Uh, first of all, it is a changing of ethnic balance in Central Asia. Uh, uh, the second one is uh, that big cities or major cities uh, have oversized economic and political significance influence on the social and economic processes. Uh, we can see that uh, major cities, um, mega cities or new, new uh, million plus cities uh, can be a uh, centers of uh, social and political protests. And the last but not least, it is a problem. It is a, it is a very important challenge for the sustainable development. It is a problem of infrastructure. And uh, when we talk about the Chinese help, uh, Chinese aid to uh, Central Asian countries uh, according <clears throat> to the Belt and Road Initiative. We can see that the help to the local government or local authorities 
we have a, we can see the huge we, we could see a, a huge uh, investment in uh, modernization of infrastructure and uh, i can i can give a lot of examples of such investments like uh, uh, lrt uh, system transport system in uh, nur sultan in uh, astana or uh, uh, reconstruction projects of uh, heat plants in kyrgyzstan or uh, tajikistan uh, investments in uh, law enforcement uh, in the big cities like uh, surveillance uh, systems, etc., etc., and the the, the 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 main idea is that uh, uh, the, the the main result of this help is not a support of sustainable development. Sometimes it's it's it, on the opposite side. It have it has uh, sometimes it has negative effect because it leads to the problems with the. Uh, support of uh, uh, corruption uh, as a result of some projects. It is a support of uh, uh, law enforcement, sometimes a strict law enforcement. And uh, I think it's it's not it's not a problem of a grand strategy, as I have already said. It's not. I, I'm not a supporter of uh, conspiracy theory. It's a, it's a sometimes it's a result of misunderstanding of Chinese side how the system works in 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 on the local on the local on the uh, uh, local level and uh, here we, we, I, I can uh, say that uh, uh, we can see the problems of even uh, in a soft power implementation in in, in Central Asia where is the most uh, uh, developed system of Confucius Institute in Central Asian countries, in, in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. But where, ki, where can we see the, the most uh, uh, well-known anti-Chinese uh, uh, protests or anti-Chinese uh, movement, uh, social, political sometimes, in, 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 in the same countries? Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a good lesson for for Chinese uh, government, uh, how to how to improve, how to make the, the aid the aid to the urban development more effective, but in 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 uh, short term period we, we I, I can see that uh, Chinese uh, Chinese uh, Belt and Road initiatives doesn't support sustainable development for urban communities. Thank you very much for your attention. I, 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 I tried to be, to be laconic. We have uh, Alicia Kitsekova. She is working at the Institute of International Relations in Prague in the Czech Republic. I want to thank the organizers for letting me be here. Um, and I also see some familiar names in the participants. So I'm saying hi to those. Um, in terms of my topic, um, it's a very broad topic. I concentrate on China in um, Central Europe and uh, specifically on um, collaboration with, um, I hope you can see the slide. Sorry, can you see the slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm only sharing one slide because I wanted to have a uh, job a graphical sort of visual for my topic, but I'm going to talk uh, in remarks. Um, so I focus on uh, Central Europe, mainly for countries as a comparative study, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary. It's been a topic of mine since about 2013, 14. So just about the start of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, as Part of my interest area, it started off with investment interests and trade, but now I'm more focused on the threat perceptions and also influence and interference. Um, some of the conclusions that I um, gathered from my research is that um, the engagements from China have led to diverse um, outcomes in these countries. Uh, some have viewed the collaboration, especially the political elites, more positively. Some were extremely passive and some were more 
uh, enthusiastic, uh, less more enthusiastic. Um, the bottom line is that the value of the political capital doesn't necessarily equal to how much commitment China gives to a certain country. Uh, this is very much uh, seen in case of Slovakia, which almost scored uh, one of the biggest uh, trade deals uh, with U.S. steel companies. The Eastern Slovakia, when Americans wanted to cancel their lease, but it didn't um, come to fruition because they changed their mind. But um, it clearly just showed that the government wasn't necessarily um, exchanging too many um, high visits with China, but they were still interesting place for Chinese investments. So that was one of the conclusions. Another conclusion uh, that I found that in some countries, the concept of Belt and Road Initiative is not necessarily even mentioned too much in media. So some of the um, interest uh, projects actually predate uh, BRI. So it's really hard to actually conclude that they are uh, the outcomes of the BRI's interactions in the region. Also, I would say um, China itself, uh, when I was working in the Czech parliament, had a chance to actually meet some of the delegations. And I noticed that China itself was just uh, figuring out how to present a narrative to the public and also governments and was sort of getting ideas and brainstorming. So it wasn't necessarily a targeted uh, strategy back then more I would say um, um, probably a government's way of engaging with the international community because, and I looked into the Chinese concepts of cooperation, international cooperation and democracy and what they were coming with as expectations early on. And pretty much it was that traditional that I hear win-win cooperation that they argued they were there for some shared interests. China believed that if they engage with these countries in Central Europe, they will eventually find shared interests, that they're surely there, but they have to interact. Unlike other countries that interact and they believe you have to have a common interest to start cooperation. So I think there is this discrepancy in expectations that China believed it can simply interact and promise and not deliver, but that already is a sign that eventually there will be a shared interest. How has this impacted uh, interactions with specific countries? When I look at Poland, um, the, the Polish leadership in 2018 wasn't still able to provide very much a clear signal to China how they perceive it because they have been quite influenced by the US-Polish uh, alliance. And, um, in 2019, in September, Mike Pence arrived to Poland as well, and they signed a statement on security issues, which were pretty much on 5G networks. And um, they were kind of interpreted at exclusion of Huawei um, from the Polish uh, telecommunication networks. Another signal that was um, strong towards China was that in 2019, uh, to employees of Huawei, executive uh, from China, and also former Polish counterintelligence officer were arrested for spying allegations. On the other hand, Pol Poland uh, established new uh, trade offices in China. So this kind of mixed messaging um, has not given a clear indication, but when I spoke to my Polish uh, colleagues on this topic, it was confirmed that it's very hard to pinpoint whether there is a, a major threat uh, perception. Uh, in terms of the Czech case, uh, it's a very good case study of a country that had a very strong view of um, um, democracy and human rights during Václav Havel's time. And then with the entry of uh, President Zeman, who's currently the president and leader, um, obviously that topic went more to a back burner and uh, investment opportunities were more welcome and the overall warming up of relations, especially with the, with the visit of Xi Jinping in 2016. Um, what's important with the Czech context, I think, is the current opposition parties are way more critical of the ideological aspects of China and arguing that that's also incompatible and can be threat to Czech Republic and also to Czech identity, which is very values-based. 
And also, I would say the academic uh, environment since about 2018-19 is very active in gathering data on media coverage, but also influence. We had a case in the Charles University where um, Center was uh, pretty much uh, sponsored through private company and uh, sponsored conferences. Uh, this was revealed and uh, this kind of uh, audit is taking place right now to what extent the Chinese embassy was influencing um, academics or students and in a way pressuring them to some author censorship. Um, I will move on then to Slovakia. Quickly, it's interesting case because there is this threat neutrality. It's not paying, it hasn't spent too much time thinking about China. Actually, uh, it's not high on the agenda, but as of now, the president Chaputova criticized human rights in front of the um, Wang Yi at the official meeting in 2019. So there is a big shift in uh, narrative and more focus on uh, whether China could be viewed as a threat or not. Uh, to the and uh, that's mainly the newly established political parties who are revisiting whether agreements such as BRR 17 plus one are actually positive contribution or harming. Hungary is one of the important cases because there is no official communication on China threat and Hungary does not recognize there is a threat. They even um, blocked statements from the European Union, which were criticizing Chinese human rights records. And I think Hungary has followed this Eastern opening um, policy going global and really just looking for opportunities. But this is in line with uh, um, Viktor Orban's uh, pretty much self-declared liberal democracy uh, style that he found for himself which is in contrast with the liberal consensus inside Europe, um, saying that China contributed to this uh, with major interference would be overstretched. I believe it's the Chinese investments, the funding that helped the party and the capital to sustain itself in power. But the opposition parties in um, Hungary are more cautious for my research and discussions, um, and they definitely would like to see more transparency, especially we talk about some infrastructure projects in this workshop. So the um, Serbia and Hungary railway um, infrastructure project, which is considered as more, um, I guess, positive cases for Chinese portfolio as, um, as accomplishment of uh, getting that far and uh, having that collaboration. But it raised eyebrows, obviously, because uh, the audits or the tenders uh, were not necessarily in line with European standards. So if I should summarize quickly, um, there, is, uh, there are stark contrasts in uh, threat perceptions, but also in terms of the interference. I think for now, the studies are not necessarily there. The Czech uh, institutes are generating documents handbooks on interference or in comparative way between Russia and China and how they both uh, diverge and uh, sort of collide in their interference in, the, in Europe as a whole, but also in Central Europe. And they provide some strategies and answers, but um, this is work in progress. And some of the information is so sensitive that I basically can get uh, mainly the open access resource um, which I found was the most accessible from the Czech security services because they provide the threat assessments and provide open information online. But uh, even they argue that it's not necessarily on high alert from China, but it is still a threat to citizens in terms of the new technologies and influencing possibly um, the discourse on big topics such as Taiwan or. Um, obviously Tibet. So those are the primary examples, but I'm happy to explore in the discussion later. We have Yuri uh, Poita. He is the head of the Asia Pacific section at the Center for Army Conversion and Disarmament Studies in Ukraine. So I'm glad you are with us too from Ukraine. Uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Yuri Poita. I'm the uh, head of Asia Pacific section at the Center for Army Conversion and Disarmament Studies in Ukraine. But now I'm currently staying in Kazakhstan because I'm, um, I'm doing my PhD dissertation at Al-Farabi Kazakh National 
University in Almaty city. So uh, my uh, report is regarded to uh, the opportunities and risks in the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative for Ukraine. And uh, what I wanted to say that Ukrainian case of participation in this Chinese initiative is interesting as an example of Chinese attempt to expand its economic and uh, political influence in the post-Soviet space. However, taking into account the European and Euro-Atlantic vectors of Ukraine's development, uh, that the traditional approach of China, which are used, for example, in Central Asia, in Europe, in our country, have their own characteristics since the country is, an, uh, is at an intermediate stage of its political modernization and the uh, development of state institution towards Western model. So the aim of the research is to investigate the interest of China in Ukraine and vice versa, and possibilities of implementation Chinese projects and prospects for cooperation, as well as challenges for national interests that arise during the implementation of this initiative. Uh, so, uh, in my course, in the course of my report, I will try to reveal the following questions. Uh, first one is political and economic overview of Ukrainian Chinese relations. Second is Chinese interest in Ukraine and vice versa. And, um, and there is a question if there, there is a common ground between our countries. And third, Initiative One Belt One Road uh, regarding opportunities and risk for our country. So, um, relations between Ukraine and China are quite complex, have a long history and develop differently uh, in different periods, depending on who was in power in Ukraine. It was intensifying. Uh, especially during the reign of ex-president Yanukovych, who was somehow pro-Russian, and uh, some kind of freezing relations during the reign of pro-Western leaders, including Mr. Uh, Yushchenko and Mr. Poroshenko. And uh, at the moment, we officially declared a strategic level of our relations, which provides theoretically provides for deepening uh, of relation and the implementation of joint strategic projects. Especially, there was a very large package document signed in 2013, and since then there was there has not been a single high-level visit between the Ukrainian and Chinese leaders since and uh, for, uh, since uh, 2019. Uh, Ukraine has a new president in power, Mr. Zelensky, and he also did not make any political movements in directions to China. So if we look at our economic relations, uh, we could also uh, notice that they evolved in different waves over different periods of time. At the moment, economically, China is the first trading partner for Ukraine after the European Union and Russia. And turnover for 2020 was uh, more than $15 billion. But trade always were in balance. Uh, you know, Chinese exports are much more than Ukrainian, and it, all, it always uh, was more than three times more. But in 2000, uh, in 2020, we can we can see that uh, the balance uh, is uh, much lower, and almost and our export and import uh, almost equal. And there is also an imbalance in the trade structure. Uh, Ukraine sells raw materials or, or goods with low added value, like some corn, iron ore, uh, sunflower oil. It's about 95% of our export. And while we buy high-tech products from China. And as for investments, we have a very, very few investments from China. Uh, annually, it's about 20 or 40 million dollars from China and uh, which is only uh, 0.05 of all foreign investment in Ukraine. For example, uh, comparing with other countries, every year Israel invests uh, $50 million um, in Ukraine, Singapore $300 million, Turkey $300 million, and Netherlands uh, $6 billion. And comparing with China, uh, it's, it's much more, much, much more. And all we need 
uh, all we uh, had from China regarding the investment were loans. Uh, for which, in in fact, uh, were a, was a lot of corruption, uh, were uh, a, a lots of corruption issues. And from the outside, uh, it looks like China has quite strong position in Ukraine and the interest. But I think it's overestimated, and our relations are not really strategic, uh, as it's claimed officially. First, we don't have any strategic projects in infrastructure. I mean, I mean, joint strategic projects in infrastructure, energy, or production. China, despite the declaration of strategic partnership and statements about the importance of Ukraine in the One Belt and One Road, practically does not invest in Ukraine and does not seek to significantly deepen our political and economic relations. Uh, Ukraine had and still remains quite active military technical cooperation, but at the moment it tends to decline. Secondly, China does not control any of important strategic facilities in Ukraine, and there is practically no Chinese enterprises in our country. And finally, political aspects, uh, as, as I mentioned in our state, the, uh, there is no dialogue at the highest level. And uh, the very important uh, aspect that Ukraine is in war with Russian Federation. And Chinese political position on this issue quite neutral or, 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 or negative uh, towards Ukraine. So uh, the reason uh, for this, from my point of view, is that Ukraine interests are different from Chinese. So Ukraine wants economic recovery yeah. with the help of, of China, the creation of high-tech industries, including in the field of military technical cooperation, and support for, from China in the Ukrainian Russian war, but China, uh, on the other hand, wants to get cheap raw materials and cheap military technologies and to get Ukraine as a loyal state without taking friendly steps to do so. So Chinese main interest in Ukraine, apart from market, is from my point of view, was to obtain military technology, which China successfully hoped with. And uh, as a result, Ukraine did not receive from China what it wanted. But China receives, uh, received everything that wanted, cheap raw materials, uh, military technologies, uh, quite big markets, so on. And uh, uh, speaking about strength and weaknesses of a participating Ukraine in the Belt and Road Initiative, so uh, I would emphasize on two strengths. So it's, it's easy to join and participate in this initiative. And uh, it could be also like uh, after after joining, it could be obtaining uh, more profitable investment, trade and business contracts with China. Uh, but there are also only only two that I, I would like to emphasize on. And there are some uh, weaknesses. Uh, it's contra contradiction between the standards of Chinese and European projects financing. Uh, this is. Um, Mm, and uh, one Belt One Road initiative does not add value to Ukrainian products, uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, this initiative weakens European integration and integration into NATO of of Ukraine. Uh, so there are there are some of them. And speaking about opportunities and threats, so I would like to say that uh, Ukraine would be included in global, global transport corridors and logistic, logistic corridors jointly with European Union. Uh, it also could be like obtaining alternative financing for projects, uh, but there are drawbacks of, of, uh, of them. And uh, uh, maybe also opportunities could be, but very unlikely from my point of view, uh, the possibility of participation of China in the deals in the region uh, as a counterbalance to China uh, and and also also uh, other some 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 others and as for threats uh, so I would like to emphasize on increasing uh, in the corruption components uh, due to Chinese attempts to obtain beneficial contracts uh, behind the uh, behind the scenes agreements and there were some examples of that. And weakening of 
European integration and the integration of Ukraine uh, into uh, NATO, uh, weakening of the defense partnership of Ukraine with the United States, um, yeah, uh, and in difficult conditions of military and hybrid confrontation with Russia, um, and 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 some 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 others of them. Uh, the direct influence of the Chinese initiatives on the democratization process in Ukraine, uh, since Ukraine is not involved very much in Chinese initiatives, and the democratization process depends on internal and external factors uh, uh, that do not yet include the influence of China from my point of view. So as for uh, findings, uh, I would emphasize on three. So the first one, cooperation with China is uh, Ukraine cooperation with, Ukraine cooperation with China is mainly about trade, and in general brings benefits as a market for our products. However, uh, this format does not allow Ukraine to reach a new level of economic de development, develop its economy, uh, and Ukraine remains a supplier of raw materials for Chinese economy, uh, or maybe a tra transit country for the Chinese goods. Second, uh, Ukraine cannot solve its security issues with the help of China, since China is not ready to act as a responsible player in the region, does not want to spoil its relations with Russia. So uh, therefore, in general, the Chinese initiative One Belt, One Road is, is not very interesting for Ukraine. Uh, however, some individual projects with China in the field of infrastructure, logistics, joint production uh, to reduce the imbalance in relation to China, uh, create additional value on the territory of Ukraine, uh, improve uh, exporting of Ukrainian goods is, could, could be very welcomed. Uh, however, it is necessary to geopolitic, ge geographically diversify our products market uh, because we have uh, very bright examples of Chinese sanctions on Australia and Canada recently. And third one uh, is that a risk of deepening cooperation with China, including One Belt, One Road initiative, significantly, uh, significant, significantly exceed the possibilities, both internal and external, the main of which is weakening of Ukraine's strategic force in the European Union and NATO, and the deterioration of relations with the United States also could be. Uh, at the moment, there are very positive trend of in strengthening relation with the USA, the Great Britain, Canada, Poland, other countries in the with European Union. So, uh, so there are there are some risks of deterioration them uh, if Ukraine uh, go towards China. Uh, we are going to much. pass on now to our keynote speech for today. And I'm very happy to welcome Ed Schatz here, who I already see there on camera. Um, so Ed Schatz is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto in Canada. So he's joining us also from Canada, where it's still very early in the morning. So special thanks uh, for still accepting under these more challenging conditions <laughs> to jo still join us. Um, and Edward Schatz specializes on authoritarianism, on social movements, social transformations, and identity politics um, with a focus on the former Soviet Union and particularly on Central Asia. And today he's going to talk about varieties of authoritarianism in Eurasia, which I think is a great topic to round up um, what we discussed throughout the past three days. So I'm very happy to have you here and would like to hand over to you. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. That's great. Thanks so much, Brigitte. Thanks, Anya. Thanks to all the other um, people who were involved behind the scenes. Normally, we, you know, when we meet in person, we get to know uh, who's doing the heavy lifting um, and we get to know them by name a little bit more. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit remote, as it were, um, when we're meeting in this in this way. But it's a great um, opportunity to meet, of course, because we can do across do so across time zones. With we had a little bit of an issue with 
figuring out, uh, we changed our clocks here in Toronto overnight. And so I wanted to make sure that Bishkek did not because I could have been an hour late for, um, for, uh, for this event. I'm glad to be here. It's a real honor to, to contribute some thoughts uh, to you that probably could have benefited from uh, attending the sessions because the, the couple of sessions that I just attended now um, really taught me a lot about um, some of the specific cases. Uh, and then that, and that would have been useful, I'm sure. Um, but let me see if I can provide some food for thought about varieties of authoritarianism in Eurasia. My goal is not really to address the BRI directly, although as you'll see, it enters into the conversation, um, in part because I think the implications of the BRI will become clearer in the next decade or so. I mean, we can see the early rumblings of, of change. Uh, but in part because the papers for the workshop, uh, as I can sense, already do this uh, already. So I, I think um, there's a lot of food for thought there. But I would like to propose that any thinking about the BRI's impact uh, for regime type should be attentive to the great variety of authoritarianism across, across this space. There's no doubt that democracy today is on the rocks. Uh, it's being battered by publics cynical about liberal values and disappointed that elections don't necessarily bring positive change as swiftly as promised. It's being challenged by regimes claiming to champion economic and social rights while showing little interest in political rights. It's being thrashed by claims that democratic polities govern poorly. And here exhibit A is the pattern by which many of the more open societies around the globe have have fared worse in the COVID pandemic. In our troubled times, democracy may seem at best to be a luxury. At worst, it may appear to be a culturally alien imposition. And the word itself is, has taken on highly pejorative meanings that could be with us for decades, if not longer. And here I'm, in, I'm thinking about post-Soviet space, maybe it applies more broadly, uh, uh, audience members will know, but in post-Soviet space, just think about the popular connotations of widely used Russian words and phrases like demokrat, pravozashitnik, pravavoye gosudarstva, uh, these things that were the buzzwords of the 1990s and the, the connotations have shifted signally over the past couple of decades. I don't think it's just post-Soviet space. In many ways, we seem to be living through what might be called an age of impunity. It's an era in which an incumbent democratic president can foment insurrection against his own democratic institutions. It's an era in which the same democratically elected president can quite literally put immigrant children into cages. It's an era in which rights for LGBTQ people come to be labeled as so much, quote, gay propaganda. It's an era in which journalists can be disappeared, can be murdered in plain sight, or dismembered in the consulate of their own countries abroad. Uh, it's an era in which business people can be taken hostage as, as just so many bargaining chips for the purposes of negotiation. It's an era in which extra constitutional machinations seem a viable route from prison to the presidency. It's an era in which kleptocrats find ample space in the global economy to squirrel away their ill-gotten spoils. And it's an era in which these very same kleptocrats hold up profit and wealth as signs of cardinal virtue when and generosity and kindness uh, come to be viewed as signs of weakness. And it's not just impunity, I would say, that characterizes our era. Autocrats around the globe are making claims, some more credibly than others, to be sure, about their ability to provide good governance. From economic growth, to public goods provision, to social welfare, to sound public health policies, the claim is that democracy diminishes efficiency. Whether or not this is true is a separate question, but that doesn't stop autocrats from regularly advancing the claim. And it's hard to dis dismiss them off the bat as simple apologetics for authoritarian uh, orders. When we know that, again, some of the more politically free countries around the globe have indeed fared poorly against a deadly virus. When we know that the rule of law with all its deliberateness seems inadequate to the, to the rapid changes that we see in digital technologies and how they reconfigure the, uh, the ways in which we interact and behave. When robust free speech protections indeed undermine the ability of states to conduct surveillance about potential security threats. These are serious questions that we need to tackle. 
And so in some, for the short term, it is hard to be, I would suggest, optimistic about democrat democratic prospects for Eurasia or in fact for the globe. We would be forgiven for assuming that there is an authoritarian juggernaut that is nearly impossible to stop. But what I'd like to do here is, is take a step to disaggregate authoritarianism, none of which is to diminish the challenge, which I would suggest is quite real, but it is an effort to question emerging assumptions about our authoritarian moment. And there are five assumptions that I see. There could be more, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, highlight five. The first assumption about our authoritarian moment is that authoritarian governments somehow share a kind of a common essence. While in some very abstract sense this might be true, in reality I would suggest authoritarianisms are more like Tolstoy's unhappy families. Just as Tolstoy opined that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, each authoritarian polity is authoritarian, as Lev Nikolaevich would have said, pasvoyemu, that is to say, in its own way. So let me pause on a few Eurasian cases, uh, post-Soviet uh, Eurasian cases. Kazakhstan's authoritarian trajectory is different from Russia's, which is different from Uzbekistan's, which is different from Tajikistan's, and so on. So let me go through a couple of these cases just by way of illustration, and we could extend this further if we were so inclined. Kazakhstan achieved its independence rather by accident. After a brief period of what Lukin Wei calls pluralism by default, its first president established firm control, buoyed by oil, oil receipts and a generally demobilized society. Its authoritarianism today is based on claims to effective governance and an ability, or a claimed ability, to manage its cultural and religious diversity. It's also based, as we know, uh, increasingly on managing and repressing its opposition abroad and at home, as Alex Cooley and John Heathershaw have expertly documented resource extraction, technocracy, and transnational oppression are the pillars of today's Kazakhstani authoritarianism. Russia's trajectory is different. Russia achieved independence when it rather dramatically seceded from the Soviet Union, which of course it was the core part of, and, 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 and moved to embrace a rather wild west capitalism and pluralism that lasted for the better part of a decade, uh, all the while enriching a class of globe-trotting oligarchs bent on conspicuous consumption. In the meantime, the Russian statists, who were suddenly on the losing end of, of the changes, saw in Russia's destiny something unique. They began to agitate and mobilize resources for a new, more patriotic Russia that could retake its rightful place as a great power in a multipolar world not dominated by the United States. Practically, its authoritarianism is based on what Keith Darden calls the blackmail state, uh, in which broad surveillance produces abundant opportunities for gathering compromising materials and Russian kompromat, thereby controlling the political field. Resource extraction, uh, geopolitical revisionism, patriotic revanchism, and anti-Westernism, not to mention this blackmail uh, state, are the pillars of Russia's authoritarianism today. For its part, Uzbekistan moved rather dramatically to distance itself from its Soviet past and by extension its relations with post-Soviet Russia. A broad social conservatism gave sustenance to Islam Karimov's narrow, negative, and as it turns out, slightly paranoid view of global connections. Uzbekistan under Karimov was not quite a hermit kingdom, but it was an in inward-looking authoritarian regime. But as we all know, this changed dramatically in 2016 with Mirziyoyev embracing Uzbekistan's ties with neighbors and partners uh, around the globe, fostering connections and economic opportunity, but also generating untold riches for select few with uncertain prospects for wealth trickling down. Uzbekistan's authoritarianism is rooted in social conservatism, a minor political opening and major economic liberalization amidst global trends to the contrary, and also based upon declaring itself open for business, not at the unipolar moment, of American hegemony, but rather amidst an increasingly multipolar world order. All of this is different from Tajikistan's trajectory. One could say much more about it. I'll just keep it short, but I'll simply offer that the country's small size, limited natural resources, not to mention its civil war, mean that it tends to trade, metaphorically speaking, on its location, its proximity to Afghanistan and to China as it charts its distinctive 
authoritarian way forward. The larger point is that authoritarian trajectories vary widely. And if we broaden our lens further to China or Myanmar or Venezuela, we realize that a simple coding of authoritarian seems woefully inadequate to appreciating the wide range of trajectories on display around the globe today. And my more quantitative, quantitatively inclined um, colleagues will say, well, I'm gonna code it anyway. And I would say to them, uh, I think you're missing something. The second assumption often made about our authoritarian moment, and one that is connected to the first assumption, is that we are witnessing a deep convergence of principles and practices such that, is, that there is essentially and effectively an authoritarian block of states. I don't doubt that it can appear this way. Russia can generally count on Chinese, China's support in the UN Security Council. China can generally count on Russia's. Yet, we have to wonder about the durability of this apparent convergence of principles and practices. Russia has embraced the Eurasian Economic Union with its own political and economic logics. And in the meantime, China, largely as we know through the Belt and Road Initiative, seeks to foster a different vision. To say that this generates contradictions and papers over differences is to put the point mildly. To date, the states involved in the EU and involved in the BRI have papered over the contradictions through broad declarations of purpose, especially through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, it's not impossible that these differences could be ironed out. They may in the future, but other possibilities loom. Let's rewind to the unbreakable friendship between Mao's China and Stalin's Soviet Union. The problem, as we know, with the unbreakable friendship, that it was much more fragile than it seemed. To quote from Alexei Yurchak in a different context, quote, everything was forever until it was no more, unquote. And after Stalin's death, relations between Moscow and Beijing soured rather rapidly. There are many reasons for these changes that should not detain us here, but suffice it to say that Mao's relationship with Stalin was a highly personal one, and each regime was the epitome of a personalist one. So if we fast forward back to today, in today's Russia, power has become increasingly personalized over the past 20 years, centered around the personal qualities and indeed the whims of one man. Likewise, China's system, which for decades seemed bent on avoiding this kind of high levels of personalization, has now slipped into a mold not terribly unlike Russia's, with President Xi assuming increasing command of more and more of the political establishment. Now, if Xi and Putin get along famously, as most reports seem to indicate, then one has to ask the difficult question, what comes late, what comes next? What comes when Putin or Xi goes out to pasture? What implications will this have for the apparent convergence of authoritarian principles and practices? The answer is abundantly clear, we don't know. This neither dooms Russia-China uh, relations to a new split any more than it guarantees that their alliance will remain unbreakable. But it does underscore the point. Behind the appearance of a monolithic block, what some scholars have called, and I think this is, uh, this is, this is, inc this is inaccurate, an authoritarian international, uh, what lies behind this is are many moving parts and many possible futures. The third assumption about our authoritarian moment is that authoritarian governments, or at least the softer, more benign, perhaps more technocratic ones, might be onto something when they claim to offer good governance. There is zero doubt that such governments can often mobilize resources, human, financial, political resources, much more quickly than their democratic counterparts to seize opportunities. These may be economic opportunities like those presented by building new transport corridors, they may be political opportunities to alter the geopolitical map, like those presented in Ukraine when social turmoil opened the door for Russia's annexation of Crimea. They may be opportunities to provide public goods, like coordination around counterterrorism or financing of infrastructure projects or uh, fighting disease, or perhaps maybe we'll see fighting global climate change. But here, I wanna suggest that we should not let our thinking about democratic governance and its challenges color how we think about authoritarian uh, governance. Today's democracies do indeed face myriad challenges from developing sound immigration pol policies to fighting climate change, to battling outbreaks of disease, to contending with anti-democratic populist backlashes. These challenges are real, but it's, it simply does not follow that some unspecified authoritarian alternative would fare better. Sure, if you could design a specific authoritarianism, it might look like this. 
and an enlightened, generous, well-versed, and infinitely capable autocrat governs a society that shares his or her values and welcomes his or her leadership. If we could ensure such an autocracy, then our bright future might indeed be authoritarian. But we can't. We don't get to choose our variety of autocracy. And even if we could, autocrats are famous for dying. When they die, they leave us with degraded, diminished, and depleted versions of, them, of themselves and their visions in their wake. Chavez in Venezuela seduced Venezuelans with the promise of something better and then left his country with the less capable, less inspirational, and indeed less legitimate Maduro. Whatever hope one might have had for Berdy Mukhamedov in Turkmenistan after Turkmenbashi's passing now looks just about as silly as one of Berdy's strange and infamous music or shooting videos. If you haven't seen them, then Google that. The reality is this, in spite of authoritarian rhetoric, regime type is orthogonal to governance. That is to say, both democracies and democracies, sorry, both democracies and autocracies can provide effective governance. And both democracies and autocracies can provide ineffective or even corrupt governance. If you're asking which regime type better addresses social and economic problems over the short or medium term, then you can expect a hung jury. On the other hand, if you're asking which regime type allows for voice and participation and which regime type is better positioned to protect its most vulnerable people, I would expect from the jury a unanimous verdict in democracy's favor. Fourth assumption. Fourth assumption is about, uh, about our authoritarian moment is uh, concerned scale. We tend to assume that the scale that matters most is the national one. This sort of methodological nationalism is understandable. One wouldn't want to ignore the importance of regime type at the national level. We have not, as it turns out, witnessed the, the dissolving of nation state frontiers with the rise of global connectivities of various sorts. So those prognosticators in the 1990s who proudly declared that the world is flat, that is that we now reside somehow in a frictionless world of unlimited possibility, untroubled by mere political frontiers, these people have gone strikingly silent and moved or moved uh, onto pontificating on other matters. Yet, I'd suggest that the national is not the only scale that matters. And it may be, depending on the question, depending on the situation, that other scales matter more for the people involved. As the Middle East scholar Lisa Wedeen has documented about Yemen, uh, which at the national scale is clearly authoritarian, Democratic practices are part and parcel of everyday life scaled and lived locally. To say that Yemen is an authoritarian context is to miss something crucial. Similarly, to say that Canada is democratic is fine enough unless and until one sits in on a typical faculty meeting at a Canadian university. Or less trivially, if you experience life as a, uh, in Canada as a person of indigenous descent then you, you clearly view these pockets of authoritarianism. The reality of authoritarianism of, of authoritarianisms is that they are shot through with democratic practices and institutions scaled at the non-national level. And the reality of democracies is that they, they too are shot through with authoritarian practices and institutions scaled at the non-national level. And this is something that feminist scholars have known for a long time, and maybe it's time we finally listen to them. We should be in the business of disaggregating politics, uh, understanding how it's multiply scaled and how such politics plays itself out variously for various communities and for various individuals involved. The cat just woke up, apparently. <laughs> um, broad patterns don't cease to matter when we use such a lens, such a disaggregating lens, but their effect, uh, uh, the effect of these broad patterns are highly mediated at all levels. Turkmenistan doesn't cease being an autocracy just because citizens tell jokes in the comfort of their kitchen about Berdy Muhammadov and at his expense. But how Turkmenistan's autocracy functions is indeed inseparable from what happens in these more intimate spaces at these more local scales. Finally, a fifth assumption about our moment and one that returns us to Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. Remember Tolstoy's full quote, which was, quote, all happy families are alike each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, unquote. 
we should return to democracies. I don't want to imply that all democracies are alike. So here I would say that the analogy to happy families fails us. Beyond some basic minimal features, I'd suggest that each democracy exists only in the vernacular. By vernacular, I mean the language or dialect spoken by actual people in actual real world context. And what I mean by using this metaphor is simple. To be effective, democratic governance requires a reckoning with the specific cultural complexities, with the specific political history, and with the spe specific sense of possibility of any given context. There is much, for example, to returning to a few Central Asian examples, there's much uh, in the Kyrgyz or Kazakh nomadic tradition that is consistent with key democratic principles. This is not to say that advocates for democracy would want to recreate the 19th century nomadic communities, but it is to say that democratic advocates would be wise to depict their initiatives as building upon and extending rather than departing from these longstanding traditions. We see this across the Middle East with feminists finding sustenance and legitimacy in the Quran and the Hadith. Uh, these feminists don't seek to deny the holy texts their place in society, but to build upon this text as they chart their very human way forward. The corollary is of course also true. Those, let's say in Russian society who would posit the ostensible incompatibility of democratic values and practices with the broad sweep of Russian political history have probably not seriously reckoned with Russia's checkered past. Consider the democratic promise of, of sayings like um, uh, in Russian, so uh, God is, God is, is, is up high, and the czar is far away, right? Lightly governed for most of its political history, Russian society enjoyed myriad freedoms by default, even if not by principle. Life in the sprawling Russian empire was no more democratic to be sure than was life in, Kyrgy in Kyrgyz nomadic encampments, but the point remains, a recoverable usable past is available for those interested in speaking democracy in the vernacular. And perhaps this is the main point. The argument for one regime type over another is not that one brings greater economic performance. Regime type may or may not grow your economy. It may or may not generate greater equity. It may or may not improve lives. It's also not an argument that one regime type brings greater political benefit by endearing a state to some great power involved in a kind of geopolitical competition. Today's darling may become tomorrow's estranged ex. Here I'm reminded about, about how sour US-Canada uh, relations became during the Trump administration. There are no guarantees, even among historic friends that share incredible cultural similarities. Rather, I'd suggest that choosing democracy is about selecting political practices and institutions that are fairer and more humane, full stop. If fairness, humanity, generosity, or freedom play any role in a state's recoverable, usable past, it too can speak democracy in the vernacular. All of this returns to the question for the workshop, which is, is the BRI a curse or a blessing for democracy? I would argue, uh, and borrowing here from Alexander Wendt, uh, an international relations scholar, um, uh, in another context, that the BRI is what states make of it. To my mind, the BRI is only loosely related to regime type, and we got some of this, I think, in the, in the, last, uh, in the last session. Uh, and I think some smart interventions uh, there are worth taking into account. Sure, uh, the BRI is a well-funded development scheme promoted and underwritten by the world's largest and arguably most powerful authoritarian regime, but the relationship is contingent. That is to say, it can cut any which way. In the short term, the BRI can provide a lifeline to authoritarian governments, especially those that are cash-strapped during difficult times. The BRI has the potential to shore up their legitimacy claims. There's nothing quite like a palpable, visible infrastructure project shouted from the rooftops of authoritarian palaces to suggest that the regime is working for the people. On the other hand, if regimes are seduced by concessional loans, but unconcerned about the quality or practical utility of the infrastructure being built, then they open themselves up to, to accusations of corruption. If regimes are unconcerned about creating jobs and distributing any new wealth generated by involvement with the BRI, then they open themselves up to populist backlash. If regimes find themselves doing the bidding of foreign governments in their treatment of minority populations, 
This builds pressure for counter mobilization over the longer term and raises the cost of repression domestically in the short term. Now, whether any of this takes a democratic turn is, harder, is hard to predict, but the BRI, by rapidly shifting the configuration of forces in tremendously unpredictable ways, certainly opens up new horizons of the politically possible. The BRI has enormously transformative potential, but if there's one thing we know from stutter, studying prior historical examples of similarly enormous transformations, it's this. The architects of change don't get to determine the final outcome. Thank you.